call the uh, regular meeting of City Council uh, for Monday, October 21st to order. And um, you'll excuse me a little bit. I got a bit of a under the weather, but we'll, we'll plow through. So our first uh, item on the agenda this morning is our delegations. Uh, 2.1, we have Kathleen Connolly, the Executive Director of the Dawson Creek and District Chamber of Commerce, uh, in attendance regarding uh, our Small Business Week proclamation. Good morning, Kathleen. How are you? Oh, dandy. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Oh, you are sick. <laughs> <laughs> I really am. <laughs> I shouldn't have hugged yeah, you. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Your small business rate is going down. <laughs> Whereas in conjunction with National Small Business Week, the Dawson Creek and District Chamber of Commerce will be celebrating local small business and entrepreneurship development. And whereas Small Business Week is an opportunity to pay tribute to the entrepreneurs who drive the Canadian economy and use their energy to expand Canada's business sector. It is also an opportunity for the Dawson Creek and District Chamber of Commerce to celebrate their accomplishments and raise their profile. And whereas Small Business Week serves as an opportunity to inform the public on how the Dawson Creek and District Chamber of Commerce plays a key role in developing small business in Dawson Creek, now, therefore, I do hereby proclaim and recognize the week of October 20th to 26th, 2019, as Small Business Week in Dawson Creek. Thank you. So, uh, we are proud to say that we've been part of the business community for 75 years. The Chamber celebrated this year. I think, as many of you know, 95% of all the businesses in our fine country are small businesses run by entrepreneurs with uh, businesses of 10 employees or less. Today, by the way, a critical day for you all to use your democratic rights to get out and vote. Make sure that we're making decisions that are supporting business and economic growth and development. And um, hoping to see a, a, a strong winter um, for our businesses. We know there are some pressures out there. So really appreciate the relationship we have with the city of Dawson Creek and other government um, because this is how we make changes is by that democratic process. So thank you so much to the city and the councillors for engaging and, and working with us to try and create a foundation for businesses to find success. Thank you, Kathleen. And uh, honestly, we say this in all sincerity, the work that you've done as executive director and also all of the volunteers who serve on that uh, board for yeah. our Chamber of Commerce have done an amazing job in representing our community for the interests of our community, for building our community and building it with a great quality of life. So That's why thank we you. All want to live here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, I'm not touching you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Kathleen. Too late. Yeah. <laughs> our next delegation uh, this morning is uh, the representatives of our Rotary Clubs of Dawson Creek, uh, Juan Tessier, Keith Brown, Dale Campbell, and Anna. I'm not going to say Gonzali because I understand it's changed. No, it's Gonzali? Okay, good. Thank you. So uh, we're going to do the Rotary Club of Dawson Creek World Polio Day Proclamation. So if you want to come on up, we'll read the proclamation. I had the other president you got married, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm not a I don't know if you were though. That well, a while ago, right? No. No. Oh, I had you as the president. <laughs> he, he's not Cold feeling medication. well today. <laughs> <laughs> we're at every year in October. People around the world shine a spotlight on the importance of global eradication of polio. And whereas World Polio Day is a Rotary International initiative to help create awareness of the ravages of polio and garner support for the eradication effort. And whereas each year the number of new cases of polio declines and we are very close to complete eradication of the disease worldwide. Now therefore I do hereby proclaim October 24th, 2019 as World Polio Day in Dawson Creek. Right. Thank you guys so much. What a great, uh, great initiative, great cause great effort by the Rotary Clubs uh, locally and worldwide to uh, end this. So thank you so much for coming today and uh, allowing us for this proclamation. The floor is yours. Rotary uh, took it as an initiative starting in 1985, I believe, to see if they could eradicate polio. They took on the first country of the Philippines and after they proved that they could eradicate polio there, World Health Organization uh, 
Center for Disease Control, United Nations, and now Bill and Melinda Gates are all partners in trying to eradicate polio in the world. For every dollar Rotary raises, Bill and Melinda Gates match it two to one. Two to one. For that, we were down to high teens of polio in the world, the wild polio virus last year. But this year, we've had a big jump in the new cases, uh, mainly in Pakistan, where the propaganda is preventing people going in and inoculating the, mm. the vaccinating the youth. So, thanks, Mayor. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you. And so we also want to take the opportunity uh, at this point, the, or the Rotary Club uh, have uh, agreed to uh, take on an initiative uh, that uh, I thought while they're here we would take the opportunity to give uh, the Rotary Club the opportunity to announce what they're doing. So this year uh, the Rotary Clubs of Dawson Creek have uh, stepped in to support the Christmas tree light up uh, this year. Uh, the city has uh, stepped away from doing that so we're happy to work with the city in partnership to make this event a successful event for this year and uh, partner with the Oilmans as well. So. Well thank you so much for that. Rotary Clubs have done such amazing work in our community and honestly we really appreciate you stepping up and uh, helping take on this really incredible event in our community in November and uh, we just want to on behalf of Council thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for being here this morning. Our next delegation uh, this morning is Tina Hill, Deborah Watt, Lindsay Drover, and Kathy Kennedy from the Ministry of Children and Family Development in attendance regarding Foster Family Month Proclamation. Good morning, ladies. Um, oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks for coming this morning. Good You're morning. Welcome. Good morning. I'm not Tina, though. No. no. <laughs> Don't touch it. Well, we're happy to have you. <laughs> Thanks for being here this morning. Thank you. Whereas thousands of British Columbia foster families provide alternate family care for children temporarily unable to live with their families. And whereas foster families are an integral and valued part of the team of public and private professionals serving the families and children of British Columbia. And whereas foster families are asked to provide emotional support and care for children who will eventually return to their own families. And whereas fostering is a community responsibility and foster families build stronger communities. And whereas the city of Dawson Creek wishes to recognize the care, compassion, an unselfish commitment of foster families within its boundaries and surrounding areas. Now, therefore, I do hereby proclaim the month of October as Foster Family Month in Dawson Creek. All right. So, uh, I sincerely want to uh, express how how much we appreciate the uh, this proclamation and foster families, and I think for all of us, families and our babies are the most important thing for us in our life and to, for foster families to step up and give these children, these babies, an opportunity to have a, have a home is such an important thing for all of us. We, should, we all deserve it. So I want to I want to say how much we appreciate that. Okay. The floor is yours. Thanks. Um, we are from the Ministry of Children and Family Development. We don't unfortunately have a foster family with us today, um, but we do want to acknowledge the work that they do for us. In the South Peace, which includes Dawson Creek, Chetwind, and Tumbler, we have about 27 to 30 foster homes uh, at this given moment in time. Um, we're always looking for more, and there are a couple of websites that I just want to put out there for sure. people to go and uh, check out. So, uh, bcfosterparents.ca, so that's the large uh, British Columbia Association uh, that is uh, involved with foster parenting. And then there's another one, um, fosteringconnections.ca. And that gives a lot more detail about um, what it's like to be a foster parent. There's stories in there from um, video clips from other um, foster families around the province. There's some video clips from uh, some youth that have um, been in our care and have been in foster homes and have seen a real benefit for them. And so they've got their little story on. Uh, it's really quite an interactive 
um, website. So if, if folks are interested, whether in this room or out however far this will reach the community, um, those would be two places I would suggest that people go if they're interested in helping out um, the kids that we end up being involved with. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. for coming in this morning. Happy voting day. <laughs> Our next delegation, 2.4, is Emma Noon and, and some delegates in regards to a request of counsel to, uh, from the Gay Straight uh, Alliance of South Peace Senior Secondary School uh, with a request to raise the pride flag at City Hall. Now, given so that this is a request, would you like this right Yeah, here? if you can just uh, take the delegation table and uh, think the mic's on. And the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Good morning. Yes. Okay. Welcome. Um, good morning. So my name is Emma Noonan, and I am one of the teacher sponsors of the GSA at, uh, at Daw Dawson Creek Secondary School, South Peace Campus. Um, and uh, this is one of our students, Marley Wolf. Uh, and we are here today to ask that, um, so next week uh, is, is Pride Week in Dawson Creek. The, uh, the Dawson Creek Pride celebration is going to be Saturday, November 2nd. And, um, and last year we, uh, we were able to um, request of the council as well that we raise the flag uh, for the week before the Dawson Creek Pride celebration. And uh, I recall a few of you in attendance then and we had a really great turnout of students. And it was a really um, sort of special and important thing for, for some of our students uh, to be able to see that and come to that and to know that uh, the city of Dawson Creek stands behind them. Um, and a city that, uh, that supports particularly its LGBTQ youth is, is a healthier city. Um, and it's, uh, and it's uh, yeah, so anyway, I brought uh, I've brought the, the flag that, um, that we're requesting that you raise. Um, and uh, we are prepared to take any, any questions that you may have about that. Thank you so much. Council, any questions? Councilor Lechner? Just a quick one. Thanks for attending. Your uh, festivities on the 2nd of November, you said, what do they entail? If you'd like to cover those for the public. Uh, sure. So um, the Dawson Creek Pride Society, which is not affiliated with the school district, uh, puts on a celebration every year. Um, it has historically been held at um, KPAC, but it's moved the last couple of years over to Encana. And it's, uh, it's a party that's 14 plus. Um, so it's, it's not quite all ages, but it's, it's a performance night and, um, and a little dance. And there are traditionally lots of students who attend as well as adults who are members of the community and um, and it's a really really fun time a really nice nice way for everybody to get together and and um, and so that's and it's a party that anybody could buy tickets for um, and and go to see and it's so that'll be November 2nd at uh, in the little hall um, at the bottom of Encana All right. thank you thank you any further questions of council well, thank you for uh, being here this morning. Uh, you're absolutely correct. We uh, did uh, raise the flag last year, and uh, I think the message for inclusive uh, community and one free of uh, racism and all of those things is one you want to make sure that we espouse to and live to. Mm -hmm. So we appreciate you being here this morning, and we'll bring the uh, request back to uh, our council meeting later this morning under Mayor's business, okay. and council will uh, decide on it at that point. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, very you much. thank you very much for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next delegation this morning, uh, 2.5, we have Jessica Kula and Brett Madden and Paul Davy from the Dawson Creek and District Hospital Foundation in attendance regarding the partnership with uh, Tourism Dawson Creek Spectra and Canada Event Center. So, if you want to, if you want to take the delegation table, is uh, great. And uh, <laughs> Alrighty. So good morning. Um, my name is Jessica Kula. I'm the executive director for the Dawson Creek and District Hospital Foundation and I have Brett Madden, our president, and Paul Davey, our vice president here. So on behalf of the Dawson Creek and District Hospital Foundation um, and our board of directors, we would very much like to extend our humble gratitude um, for the opportunity 
to be a legacy partner in the WHL exhibition series that took place in our city um, in September here. Uh, we recognize that without thoughtful, engaged community leaders like all of you sitting here, as well as many within our community, um, that we would not be able to do and fulfill the needs that we do um, on a daily basis and our mandate. Um, the Encana Event Center, or sorry, our partnership with Tourism Dawson Creek, um, Spectra Management, Venue Management, and the Encana Event Center is invaluable in the way that it's furthered our organization just in the short month um, that since this event. We were able to spread our message to a larger, larger, broader audience and educate the community on the importance of what we do. In addition to the platform this event provided to us, we were able to raise $35,000 to help purchase necessary equipment for our hospital um, and our OR department specifically. Um, so therefore, I just really like to extend our gratitude um, to the city for allowing us to do this and be a partner in this event. Um, and I think Brett has a just a quick add to it. Um, I think sports tourism around the community sometimes gets criticized a little bit sometimes where it seems like it's hockey, hockey, hockey and there are some uh, people in the community that might feel that there's no value there if you're not one of those hockey people. But by uh, pairing with us as the hospital foundation, as the legacy partner during this event, I think that We've shown the community that it's not necessarily always hockey, hockey, hockey. The hospital is one of those things that unfortunately everyone uses, or fortunately, you know, if you have a baby, that's a good thing. If you're in the ER, that's a bad thing. So um, these sports tourism events may seem targeted uh, often, and I think they may come under scrutiny often for that reason but this is a way for them to be so much broader and have a, such an impact in the community. And, and this month for us was just amazing, it was huge. And we owe this month largely to this event. We had other events happening in the same month that we also saw success in. Um, but that being said too, we had three different events going on and they were all kind of partnering and we saw a lot of synergy between three different organizations all tying into this event too. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. Council questions, comments? Thank you for what you do. Yeah, yeah I, I, honestly, the, uh, the opportunity that's created, and I think you talk about a community that's built upon a great quality of life, health, and happiness, and healthcare, uh, education, economic opportunities to me are the pillars of that. And to see the work that you guys have done volunteering for our community and our region, and it is region when I say that. The Dawson Creek and District Hospital is a regional acute care facility. And without a strong acute care uh, system, your primary care model uh, is much more vulnerable. And so the work that you guys have done in putting the effort in to helping uh, build a strong acute care facility for our region, uh, just I can't express how much I appreciate it. Um, and the other thing I love about uh, seeing you guys in action is uh, the youth of our community. The, the next generation coming in, uh, sit, stepping up and becoming involved in our community. And I love the fact that you guys are doing that. So thank you. Thank You're you. pretty young too. Right? <laughs> you, should, you should see it from this side. <laughs> so uh, the, the sport tourism model is exactly that tourism and it brings people into our community and creates opportunities of economic opportunities and, and the, uh, the fact that this turned into the, a really strong event that allowed us to build tourism in our community, build other uh, folks coming into our community to spend money and leverage it into the opportunity of raising some money for the hospital foundation just as a win-win-win. So really thank you guys so much and thank uh, thanks to Lindsay and Barry and Ryan and all the folks at the event center and tourism and all of that that made this happen. The gala on the Friday night was just an amazing night and yeah we really appreciate it. So thank you for coming in this morning. Thank you so much. Great job. You kids. <coughs> Uh, 2.6 this morning and it's uh, almost a little bit appropriate in some ways that uh, we have the hospital foundation and now we have Dr. Paul Winwood uh, as our delegation from the Northern Medical Program and Northern Medical Program Trust and 
And so the, it's really uh, uh, very appropriate that we have uh, this uh, delegation this morning. I really appreciate uh, Dr. Winwood coming this morning to give us an update on the trust and the work that the trust has been doing. And, and so welcome to uh, Dawson Creek and Dawson Creek Council. It's a pleasure to have you here this morning and the floor is yours. So thank you very much for having us here this morning. So I'm, Paul, I'm Dr. Paul Wimbledon, I'm the, the head of the Northern Medical Program and I have with me Chelsea Manel, who's one of our third year medical students who's currently spending a year in the piece here uh, studying and training. So she's going to say a few words. I have a brief presentation, but the purpose of my being here today is um, one, to thank you for all your support as members of the Northern Medical Programs Trust. Two, to tell you a little bit about the program and three, and perhaps most importantly, is to ask for your support and help in finding the next generation of physicians to work in the North, because we need, we need your youth to come to our program, because they're the ones who are going to stay and work here. So um, this is my presentation. These, these four students here, or grads here from 2015, are all from Dawson Creek. And um, uh, um, Dr. Um, oh, where was he? Can't see him now. <laughs> um, Oh no, oh, no, perhaps he's not there. Okay, okay. Um, so I was going to uh, I thought Dr. Banners was on this one, but he's not. He's working in Chetwin. Anyway, in that year, 2015, we had four grads from Dawson Creek. Another year we had two, but we've not had any other years. So I'd really like to have <coughs> regular students from Dawson Creek. Um, our program, as you probably know, is focused on training physicians who are going to work in rural and northern areas, and that's really to address the imbalance of physicians between urban and rural uh, communities in, in Canada. Um, just a little bit here about what it takes to become a physician, because sometimes I think people don't appreciate how long this is. So, oh, here, here's my point of it. So, this is the entry point to the MD program. Prior to that, students will have done a bachelor's program, usually for four years, often with a bit of time in between while they prepare themselves for medical school. Then they're in MD training for four years. Chelsea here is in her third year, so she's about there. And then they will go into what we call residency training, and there's a minimum of two years training to be a family physician, but they usually spend another year or two doing some additional work, they might do something like OBGYN, they might do eMERGE, so they get extra skills, which are very important if you're going to work in rural areas. Or the specialists here may spend another seven years. So it can be up to 11 <coughs> years from the time of entering to medical school that someone gets out into practice. So we, gra we graduated our first physicians in 2008 which means that some of them now are only just coming out into the workplace. So sometimes people wonder why there's not more, but in fact, um, I'm going to give you some data that shows you that we're doing well in getting physicians into the north and rural areas, but it's a long process. This slide sort of shows the same thing, but this, this, this sort of shows the different stages of a training, but here's the point. Um, we need to sow the seeds in our youth early about the idea of working in health professions. And I'm here to support not just medicine, I'm here to support all health professions, nursing, physiotherapy, occupational therapy. And you, you may know that in addition to having a northern nursing program about to start, we're also about to get a northern physiotherapy and occupational therapy program up here. This here is the road show. So we have a, a, um, a career road show that goes out across the north every year um, for, for a week, in fact, now two weeks, they do two separate weeks visiting communities and, in, and visiting high schools primarily, encouraging your youth to uh, enter health professions. They are here next year, and um, in, in fact, um, and, 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 and they were up through Fort Nelson last year and up through, um, and in fact, up through the Yukon for a bit. <coughs> These are the different stages of training. In fact, uh, uh, this is actually in Fort St. John training residence and I put this one on here because many of our docs then sort of spend a bit of time doing what, what I call walkabout where they, they'll do locums and they'll go different places while they decide where they want to settle and then they'll settle into practice. This is Dr. James Card who was one of our first grads uh, from, from 2008. He worked in McKenzie for a while, he now works uh, in Prince George and Valmount and he's the, the, the head of our family practice residency program in Prince George. So they do come back and they do do great things. So the Northern Medical Program has 32 students in each year. We pride ourselves on having a very high preceptor to student ratio and really having a kind of much 
much more of a sort of family and supportive atmosphere than you might get in a large urban program. Our Northern Physicians act as role models and we particularly uh, like to focus on indigenous health exposure and on rural and family practice. Uh, and our ultimate goal uh, is to improve healthcare in your communities. Um, this, is, this is a complicated slide, so I'm just going to get you to focus on this bottom line. Just to show you that 68% of our students come from rural communities in BC, that's what the RSA communities are. And 41% come from within the Northern Health area and 23% within Interior Health. So this is the bulk of our students. Um, so what about our course? They spend the first two years uh, at the, the UNBC campus in Prince George and they do uh, fundamentally basic medical sciences, but they are exposed to clinical practice from the first uh, semester, in fact even from their first week, but they have lectures and labs and small group sessions, they go out to the community. We particularly offer them northern and rural opportunities, um, they develop their clinical skills and they have focused family practice. In the third and fourth years they're doing predominantly clinical training and they may spend their third year in Prince George doing various specialties um, or some will do what we call an integrated community clerkship. And in the fourth year, they do electives where they can actually go anywhere and choose for much of a year what they will do. Obviously, it has to be approved. Just going back to the <coughs> third year, um, some of our students will do what we call an integrated community clerkship, and we have those in Fort St. John and Terrace. And in that year, they spend the whole year in this community, and they see kind of everything all together. So in the traditional clerkship, they might spend six weeks doing medicine, six weeks surgery. When they do a, an integrated community clerkship, they can see anything, any day, which is the reality of working in a community like Dawson Creek or Fort St. John. And I'm just going to ask Chelsea to speak to that, because that's what Chelsea is doing now. She's based in Fort St. John, and um, she does spend a bit of time in Dawson Creek during the year. But Chelsea, why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself and why you're here and what you're getting out of it? Sure. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Chelsea, like Dr. Winwood said, I'm a third year Northern Medical Program student, uh, currently up in Fort St. John for my third year. So I grew up in Prince George, did university there at UNBC. My first two years of med school were down in Prince George as well. Uh, and now up here I get to see kind of all aspects of medicine day to day. So just as an example, last week I have one day in the birthing center, a day in surgery, um, a day in the family practice clinic and then a day with a specialist such as a pediatrician and I really get to kind of mix around and see people all over the community that way and it's a really good longitudinal experience for me. Um, long term I want to go into rural family practice so I really appreciate having the opportunity to be up here uh, learning in a community and from rural doctors. I think it's much more relevant to my experience to be able to learn from doctors who live and work in the way that I want to, rather than learning from big city practices. It makes a big difference to me. Um, and learning actually up in the Northeast is really important to me too, because before coming up to Fort St. John, it wasn't actually on my radar to practice in the Northeast. And now that I'm up here, I actually am really enjoying the area. And actually, it's a, in my top pick to, to come back for training. So um, it, the support that we get to be up here is really appreciated, and I think really makes a difference to the community. Thank you, Chelsea. So um, what I didn't say, but Chelsea alluded to, is that so these are students from two years ago in Fort St. John, and they're holding checks which come from the Northern Medical Programs Trust, which supports them to be able to spend their year up here to cover all their expenses, because it's a big thing to, to, to up from Prince George and come up here and find accommodation, etc., just for the year. So um, you guys are supporting these students being up here, and we're very grateful for that. Um, just to tell you a little bit about where our grads are. So this is grads who go into family practice. Um, and uh, family, it's, it's about two thirds of our grads go into family practice. If we compare the three programs at UBC, this is Vancouver, this is a Victoria program, this is Prince George. 64% of our grads in family practice um, have gone into um, have gone into pra have gone into residency programs for the rural and northern. So we really we really do succeed in getting our grads to go <coughs> into rural and northern uh, family practice residency programs. This shows the overall outcomes of our program for where uh, our graduates are working. So 64% are working in northern and rural areas, and com that compares with 9% from the Vancouver program and 29% from the Victoria program, known as the Island Medical Program. So we are putting physicians out there into your communities. 
Um, if we look at our residency programs in the north, and we have residency programs in Prince George, Terrace, and Fort St. John, uh, two thirds of those grads are working in rural and northern communities. And if they're NMP grads, 73% are working in northern BC. So very high retention rates if they train in the north as a student and train in the north as a resident. We're looking at 73% who stay. Um, so where do you come in? So we need to do things to ensure that we recruit northern uh, uh, students to medicine and other healthcare programs. We have a number of community engagement programs. We have tools in our admissions system that help us select or that will help to select students with an affinity for practicing in rural areas. And we call that the rural, remote and rural um, uh, uh, suitability score. Uh, as you've heard from Chelsea, we immerse our students in, uh, in rural practice. Uh, and um, we get out there with things like the healthcare roadshow and weekend shadowing to encourage students to, to practice medicine in the north. Uh, this is the healthcare roadshow. I was telling you about it coming to Dawson Creek uh, next year. These pictures are in Fort St. John and Tumblr Ridge from previous years. Um, so um, I think that's all I've got to say. Hey, I'm going to stop there and invite any questions. There's only one other thing I want to tell you about, and that is that the Northern Medical Programs Trust is supporting a program called Northern Pathways to Medicine. And Northern Pathways to Medicine is a program that we've developed in the last two years to support our disadvantaged <coughs> students, so generally socioeconomically disadvantaged students, through their undergraduate program at UNBC, and they get a combination of financial support and enrichment activities to help prepare them for application to health professions. And I'd like to leave some cards with you guys that you can circulate uh, amongst your community. Can I pass those around? And um, I might ask outside if we can get someone to put a poster up. Because we really want we really want your students to apply for this. We support we're supporting three students a year. Um, I think so far three or four of our students have come from Prince George and we want to get more in from from the um, from the broader communities of North DC. So thank you very much for listening to me and um, it's been a great pleasure to be here today. Thank you. And so I, if I could ask one question just yeah. before we go around the table, Dr. Winwood, and that's the establishment of the Northern Medical Trust uh, yeah. happened uh, a long, long time ago. And could you give a little history on how that's uh, functioning and who, uh, for a council, because we have a number of new councillors that probably yeah. aren't aware yeah. of the trust. Well, it's before my time. <laughs> yeah. It's before my time there. But, um, so um, I believe it, it was actually established around 2002, when the, and the medical program was established in 2004. And um, I have to tell you, I think it's unique. I think it's unique globally, actually, that a bunch of communities came together with also some of the in industries from the north. So um, I think Can4 and Alcan also contributed and have put money and continue to put money into a trust fund, which is now sitting at more than $10 million. And the, um, you know, the, the, the annual uh, payouts from the money invested in that have created an endowment that we can use to support students. And Dawson Creek is one of those communities. And really, it's, 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 it just lets us do some very special things, like this Northern Pathways program, like supporting students to spend a year in, in Port St. John, like supporting shadowing programs in rural communities, like supporting indigenous shadowing programs. There's also like, supporting nurses coming out to rural areas. Um, so there's all sorts of things it's done. And it, uh, it's truly unique. It supports the roadshow. It's unique, and in fact, we've written it up this year as being a unique thing uh, worldwide. And so, yeah, huge thanks to you, and, and, and a huge thanks to the communities of Northern BC. Thank you for that. I, and I, I guess that's so I just wanted to give a little bit of background because it is all of us. I think there's very, very few communities in North, Northern British Columbia who didn't participate in the original establishment of it. And so it's turned into exactly that a, very, a huge benefit. So, Council, questions, comments? Councilor Luxton. Thanks, Your Worship, and thanks for your presentation. A couple of quick questions. Could you speak the forgivable student loan program for medicine? Can you tell me where that's at today? Is there not uh, the ability for students uh, who practice or contribute to northern or rural medicine to access a forgivable student loan program? Um, I'd have to be honest with you and tell you I, I'm not sure how it is today. Okay. I don't know that it's completely forgivable. Do you, do, do you know? I don't know the specifics of it because it doesn't really apply to me yet, but from what I know, I think 
the government of BC. Yes, has yeah, it is. Loan forgiveness, and I think it's up to five years, and they'll forgive up to 20% per year. But I don't know if, if, if you that's practice still in the a rural exact or, numbers. Yeah, okay. And yeah, it's not. They have a list of communities on their website that they support in that, and I'm not sure which ones specifically they are. Okay, it just seems like a wonderful program. It's uh, in some ways, and uh, it could be unfortunate when somebody comes out and graduates, and you would know this better than I. Many say, "Gee, I can look at Victoria, Kelowna, Vancouver, Dawson Creek, or Fort St. John." Many times they choose the larger <laughs> centers down south. Um, so I, I think that's something, and I can do a little follow-up on that as well. I think it's a great program. I think there may be something we have to look at in order to ensure, although the Northern Medical Program is securing uh, many of their graduates to the North, I'm not sure that's the same can be said for the Southern Medical Programs. And I don't think we graduate enough to look after our needs in the North, do we, from the Northern Medical Program? We do need to attract additional that, that would be my opinion. Okay, okay. That's, that uh, would be my uh, opinion. Okay. Um, but your point is well made that there are, there's, you know, there's, a, there's an oyster full of places for people to go in BC. Yeah. And so it's very easy to go south, and, and many do. Oh. Um, and I think actually part of, I mean, I didn't say this, but actually the message I often take to communities as well is that it's very important that communities welcome and look after their physicians. Oh, very much. And, and their students, as you are because uh, that's what actually, more than anything, I think the community is what makes people stay. All right. Support the community. Two other quick ones. One I'll combine. There is no integrated community clerkship program or residency program at the Dawson Creek Hospital. Can you explain why we wouldn't qualify for that or are we waiting for our new hospital to be built before That's one of the reasons in? I'm here today, actually. <laughs> okay. But, um, you know, it's about persuading the physicians that they would want to do this. It is quite a lot of work for the physicians to train here. Okay. And um, um, I think, you know, I think up to now, the physicians in Dawson Creek haven't felt they have sufficient capacity and time to do that. They do take residents and students um, for, for what we call electives for four week periods of the time. Chelsea will spend some of her time here um, coming down from Fort St. John during the year and the residents do, but I'm actually here to encourage them to do more and take more students. All um, right. It would be lovely to have a residency in ICC program here. Perfect. <laughs> one final one, Your Worship, if I could, and this is probably going to be a difficult one to answer. So, as doctors graduate, they receive their billing number through MSP, as I understand it. As a con contractor to the provincial guy, call it that. I mean, it's a billing number. You're an independent business person as a doctor. What are your thoughts on saying, if I hand a graduate a new billing number, that billing number stays in Dawson Creek for three years, then you're free to move wherever you want to go? <laughs> That's very controversial. It is, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, so they do have return of service programs for three years for international medical graduates. Mm -hmm. Um, but not for Canadian medical right. And um, obviously the arguments in favour are that it helps ensure you have a supply of physicians in a community. Uh, the arguments against it are that um, Canada is a, a free country and people have the right to choose what they want to do. Um, but I think actually more importantly is that what, what we're seeing in, in Northern BC and the experience internationally is that although they will do their three years, if you're forcing people to come, they won't stay. Okay. And if you really want a sustainable, long-term, uh, <laughs> effective, and, and invested workforce, uh, then you should train people who want to be here and provide them with the support that will make them want to stay. So I think it's a short-term solution sometimes, okay. but I don't think it fixes things. And I raise that not so much as a counselor for Dawes Creek, but certainly some smaller communities. Yeah. I mean, we're very fortunate with our physicians and the people that come to live and work in our healthcare facilities here. But there are others that stu struggle far greater yeah. than uh, our community, for example. Yeah. That's why I asked yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Well, my you. hope that we'll provide them all with a physician in town. And actually, you know, when I travel across northern BC now, and I do these trips sort of twice a year uh, out to the communities, in many, many communities now I'm meeting our grads, but certainly some of the smaller ones, yet we have to populate places like Taylor and Hudson's Hope, but we'll get there. So. All right. <laughs> Thank you for your Thank work. Thank you. Other questions? <laughs> Councillor Parsel? When I read, uh, I skimmed through your uh, slideshow here, 
in preparation for this meeting. Just this is a, a funny comment. I got fixated on your uh, demographic and these letters in brackets RSA. Uh -huh. And I read it as Republic of South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, 68%? Yeah, that's about right. Without the South Africans, I don't know what sort of medical system we'd have in the North. As a sidebar comment, my colleague Blair over there talked about this uh, three years stuff. I know that in Australia, yeah. it's five years, and they do have it. Yeah. And the argument is, uh, and this is true for a whole large, a bunch of other professions, is there's a heavy investment of public tax dollars in the training of all professionals. And um, to illustrate my point, once upon a time, I, as school superintendent, I uh, did the recruiting. I got out of recruiting quite quickly, but I, I did it. I went to SFU to interview prospective teachers. And I think the Canada Manpower there had maybe 300, it might have been 600 teachers, and there were only eight willing to consider employment in the north. <coughs> and that led to our own um, Alaska Highway Consortium for Teacher Education here, where local people were enabled, empowered to take their talents and invest them in some training, and most of those stay here. So I mean, very enthusiastic supporter for uh, this northern program, for sure. But I, I'm not sure if I agree with your statements about requirements. Uh, that's another issue. This is, is a heavy investment in post-secondary yeah. education, not only by the students, but also by the taxpayers. That's my comment. Councillor Wilbur. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, and I am going to follow up with you uh, later this week t about the roadshow, because I'm very interested in that. And one thing I knowing and, and to lighten the mood, they've kind of covered the heavy stuff. Um, when we have had doctors visiting and stuff, I have had the honor of picking them up and touring them through our community um, and showing them that we do have things that they're looking for and they're not as far away from home as they think. So um, I look forward to maybe having that discussion with you um, down the road and seeing how uh, the Health Services Society can participate in this and showcasing our community. Because I think part of getting doctors to want to stay is showing them what is here for them and what's available. And a lot of times, um, these young students don't realize what rural BC has to offer and especially the North. So um, I look forward to that and I would like in some aspect to be involved when you come. Thank you. And um, I, I think that's right, but particularly students from the lower mainland and it speaks to uh, Councillor Parslow's point, they actually don't know what they're missing up here because they've never been here and um, you need to immerse them in it. Excellent. Um, and you know, I would say I, I was in Dawson Creek on, on, on other business a few weeks ago and um, I mean no one knew who I was or what I was doing and I was treated so kindly and so well by the people I met so it's a great community and it's a shame that more people don't come and experience it. Yes we need to do a better job of seeing who we are and if I just could have one more yeah. I was going to save it for a new councillor business but since you're here um, the Health Services Society actually just purchased the Cody system oh, and yeah. it was put into Tumblr Ridge, Chatwin and Dawson Creek Emergency mm -hmm. um, and the doctors were overwhelmed that within 30 seconds they had an internist on live on live feed um, in their emergency room. So we're, that was something that we could do as a society for doctor retention and to support them. And I think that's another aspect is letting these young students come out know there are tools available for them in, in rural BC. I think that's critical. It's, it's a great program at Cody, yeah. Councillor Earl. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you uh, both for your time here today. Uh, just to uh, Councillor Wilbur's point, there's also, uh, and they're not terribly well publicized, but there are also, uh, with respect to integrating new doctors, physicians, healthcare professionals into the community, there are uh, young professional organizations that do meetups and stuff like that. I know as somebody who moved here 10 years ago and didn't grow up here, as an adult, uh, sometimes meeting people and making friends can be very difficult, and uh, especially with the I mean, the, the media is, is one thing where it's very similar. They come here out of school, they get their work experience, and then they kind of move on. Uh, because Dawson Creek can be a very lonely place if you don't work in industry, if you don't work in trades where most people are employed. Um, it's kind of hard to make friends if you're outside that circle. So uh, we do also have those uh, things available. So it might be worthwhile touching base with Northern Health and the physicians to uh, 
make sure they have those connections. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Further comments? Further questions? So the, uh, you mentioned the um, local physicians. Now the establishment of the South Peace Division of Family Practice is a very positive uh, step for the South Peace. And um, when they start construction of our new hospital next year, see how I got when in there? Yes. Uh, when they start the construction of our new hospital next year, it just, I think, will continue to give us the ability. We've got a strong, strong uh, primary care network here right now. I believe in the family physicians that are uh, operating in Dawson Creek. We're really, really fortunate in terms of the group we we have. But like everything, they uh, transition uh, along, and uh, so we need to continue to keep building upon that. The South Peace Health Society is an organization formed by uh, and on behalf of all of the South Peace to help uh, enhance health services that are outside the purview of Northern Health. And the Peace River Regional District now of funding uh, $100,000 to the North Peace Division of Family Practice for the residency program. They uh, have the 75000 that goes to the South Peace Health Society, $100,000 and 110000 now in scholarships uh, to our RNs and our LPNs and our home support workers and uh, employees of Northern Health uh, who want to incur, engage and improve their uh, skills education or training. So I think the region, we've done a lot of very positive stuff and we're in good shape, but we really need to keep continuing to push that along. We really appreciate you guys being here today and helping to uh, uh, build that uh, message of how important healthcare is. I was encouraged by the front slide in terms of the four physicians, uh, the, the kids from Dawson Creek. And, the, and I would ask this to Chelsea because I was in, uh, interested in your comment about uh, close to home in Prince George, but practice outside of that. And the kids that graduated here now are Dr. Winnegar and Clark and uh, Dr. Um, um, Wayne and McIntyre. And so the kids, they, they practiced in the north but didn't come back to Dawson Creek. And it was interesting to me that um, when you start to practice medicine, um, it's more difficult in a community where your, your patients may be your family or your friends. And so I, I was interested to hear uh, your comment about that in terms of not going home but being close to home. And is that a factor in your choosing a, uh, a practice? Yeah, I'm not sure if I can speak that well to that because <laughs> Prince George is quite a bit yeah. larger, I guess. So yeah. a practice there would be, I think, quite different in that it would probably not be a lot of people that I grew up with. Um, but for me, I'm actually looking at going somewhere smaller than Prince George anyway. So it's not really a factor that's playing into my decision anyway because I already want to go somewhere smaller. Um, but I'm sure that might play a role in some people's. Yeah, I guess the evolution of uh, hospital privileges, work and, work and merge, potentially interacting there, just I, that's all those factors. I'm, and I was interested to hear that anyway. W welcome, and uh, we're happy you're here in Northeast BC. Thank you. We Thanks so much for being here Dawson. today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we might not let you go back. <laughs> thank you so much well, for being you. here today. Thank you So we'll now go to uh, item three, uh, new councillor business, 3.1, councillor Javekha. Oh, councillor Electro. Your worship, at this time, I will remove myself from the room uh, and declare conflict. Through my business, I bid on properties through the tax sale in Dawson Creek, and I just don't want to see uh, any perception of a perceived conflict. Okay, so. thank you. Right. So I'll just uh, read out my uh, motion. Ron Jabs purchased a property, 1201 102nd Avenue at the city tax sale in 2018 for $30,000. He was told there was a lien against the property. However, he was not aware that there were multiple liens actually totaling $1.574 million against the property. So I move that council purchase the property that Ron Jabs purchased in the 2018 tax sale as he was unaware of multiple liens on the property for a substantial value and put the property on the city's list of available properties after resolving the issue of the liens. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Parslow. Discussion? Councillor Chebekov? 
So this is, uh, it's alarming to me. I mean, if I purchased a property and uh, was unaware that there was $1.574 million against it in liens, um, especially from the city, which, you know, you would think that the city would have made made the purchasers aware of that fact. Um, in fairness, I, I think that we need to resolve the issue by purchasing the property back. Thank you. Councillor Earl. Uh, a couple things, Your Worship. Uh, first of all, um, in looking into this matter, it, it appears as though, and I had to talk to some people at the credit union about how one would go into looking, uh, doing some due diligence or research into how many liens would be put on a property and how much it would uh, cost and time to do that. So um, through BC Land Title and Survey, which is an online portal, you can find out how many liens are against a property through the uh, computer for $12, um, and it takes about five minutes. Um, given that this is a business venture, and um, it, presumably I saw some other properties that were purchased by Mr. Jabs. This isn't his first time um, doing this. I would have been very surprised that this level of due diligence wasn't done before purchasing or bidding on the property. Not only that, but um, we don't have, to the best of my knowledge, the ability to offer a refund for this property. We'd be buying this property for $30,000 and assuming the liability, that $1.57 million um, in liens, it's not like when it was in a tax sale, not only that, but um, that $30,000 that, that was paid for the property isn't all the city. The only amount we get to keep is the portion that was owed on taxes. The other 20 or so thousand dollars belongs to the people who have liens against it. So um, as much sympathy as I have for Mr. Jab's predicament, um, I don't know that it's appropriate for the city of Dawson Creek and our taxpayers to be underwriting, um, I guess, property speculation, a business venture like this, and it sets a bad precedent moving forward. Thank you. Council, uh, Duncan first and then Councillor Parson. So through your worship, if I, if I may just clarify a couple uh, pieces here. Good morning, Council. Um, <laughs> so the community charter requires that we sell delinquent properties after three years. So a property that hasn't paid property taxes for three years um, must be sold through a tax sale. And after sold, the registered owner has another year to redeem that property. Um, after it's sold, um, the purchaser uh, pays the amount, has till noon that day, and uh, signs a purchaser statement, essentially a sales agreement. Um, Liens are placed, and, and just a little bit on the liens, uh, the lien is a mechanism to force the, the hand of the owner of the property to pay their debt. In this particular case, when it comes to tax sale, only higher level liens uh, remain. Any banking or any lower than local government liens uh, are removed from title, and only provincial or federal liens, in this particular case, CRA, um, remain. And uh, the idea is that when there's a lien on there, often a financial institute won't loan against that, that property. Um, also, it can go to a court-ordered sale, at which point uh, all funds received from the sale are returned to whoever is holding the lien on that property. So there is a bit of a misconception that, you know, 1.5 or a million dollars uh, liens on this property. The property and the lien amount is only the value of that property. So if this property were sold, and uh, CRA would only come in for the value of that property and the person that's purchased the property doesn't owe $1.5 million to CRA. They only own the property and when the property is court ordered sold, that's the end of that transaction and it's done. In this particular case, um, 120102 102nd Avenue, this property was sold twice that day. So somebody purchased that property at 10 a.m. Uh, they were unable to pay uh, within the allocated time frame and it was sold again uh, at 1 p.m. City of Dawson Creek uh, goes over and above. We're not required. However, we do provide title searches uh, at the tax sale. And uh, in, in particular, this property had, a mul uh, had multiple um, 
liens against it. We don't provide the value. Uh, however, we do we do provide that search, and there is an, uh, an amount of time that the individual can go search out that property and understand uh, what those values are. Um, as mentioned by Councillor Earl, uh, we do not keep the entire uh, amount. Our upset for this property was ten thousand uh, dollars. Upset meaning this is what was owed in, in outstanding property taxes. The other twenty thousand dollars is actually returned to the owner if they make a, an application or an institute that has a lien on the property can come in and request that $20,000 be put into a judicial fund and through court they can uh, they can try to receive that funding. Um, also there's a, a property transfer tax and uh, essentially a judge can order that sale as mentioned before. In this particular case and in this particular request, um, this is a tax sale. The onus is on the purchaser. This is an investment opportunity. And if the property isn't redeemed, then the purchaser acquires that property. This property had liens on it. That is unfortunate. If the city of Dawson Creek opted to um, purchase this property, we are voluntarily accepting uh, those liens. And we are voluntarily accepting anything else that's on that property. So in this particular case, it's an ex service station or previous service station and uh, could have contamination. Now we're only required to mitigate contamination if it's impacting other properties or if, if required. Uh, however, there is that risk. In this particular case, a purchase uh, cost or purchase price of 30000 we would actually be losing $20,000 on that transaction and a court at ordered sale could result in the city no longer owning that property and receiving nothing from that sale uh, as well. It's very unfortunate. Um, it is not necessarily a precedent I would recommend Council want to set. Uh, there are other options for the purchaser, uh, potentially to notify the CRA, let them know that this po uh, property has been sold and that there is a $20,000 surplus, at which point they can notify claim to that uh, and possibly remove those claims and remove those liens if they're successful. However, the city typically doesn't get involved in that process. Thank you, Duncan. Councillor Parkle. This, this is an uh, important uh, topic to uh, the council to talk about. First of all, I, um, I believe that the city uh, does a, a, a good job in advising uh, people about the, con the risks associated with this sort of thing. My view is um, I could not in any conceivable way if I was uh, put myself in the purchaser's position figure that we would be selling something with a million million sits or whatever the figure is liens uh, against it. <coughs> uh, you know one of our aspirations is that uh, we see this community develop continue to develop and until these liens are removed this is stale property um, and uh, so I would thought we would have an interest prior to sale of knowing what liens are there. If it's as, as my colleague uh, Jeremy just said, a 12 minute search or whatever, or $12 cost to do that, that's easy. Uh, because uh, we, we want to do all we can. I think we would have a greater leverage in having this property removed from being sort of de facto stale because of the liens than uh, an individual. Um, I just don't know about that, but uh, my concerns is it, well, did we know? No, I don't think we did know. <laughs> um, should we know? I'm wondering, should, if we, should we have known about that? And secondly, if we are going to have our downtown revitalized, we need to have these properties uh, available for sale at a, at a without all these encumbrances. And how, how do we go about that? Thank you. Councillor Giveco. Uh, just a couple more points. I, I agree that, uh, you know, somebody working at, Lake, at Lakeview Credit Union is astute enough to, to go through the process and find out all the details. And uh, they probably do have a membership with the BC government so they can access the, the website. Um, my concern is that I guess the follow-up of the city to disclose complete information. Now, if this property 
was listed with a notation that there's $1.574 million in liens against this property, would there be any bids? Now, you can look at it two ways. Maybe there's an advantage to not disclosing that so that you do get bids and get rid of this property that has contamination and other issues, or you could disclose this fact that there's this huge liability there and probably not get bids and end up owning the property. Um, I could see if this number was attached to the information during the auction that you would not be getting any bids. So I, I guess to me it's sort of a, you know, an ethical issue. But uh, I strongly support us uh, making, correcting the, the situation. Duncan? So through your worship, just for clarification, it's not the, se uh, the city selling city property. We're selling property on behalf of uh, a delinquent property owner in order to recoup our taxes. And yes, yes, we do end up with this property if it, it doesn't sell. And yes, we do provide title searches to try to flag situations where people might make a bad investment choice. Um, however, it isn't our property. In, in the end, if we end up with this property through tax sale, we're receiving it involuntarily, which has a lot less risk than if we receive it voluntarily. Thank you. Councillor Earl, Councillor Wilbur. So just for clarification, if somebody isn't uh, technologically inclined, you can also just walk into a Service Canada office and get a report on uh, detail on the number of liens against property and the amounts of those liens. Um, once again, for me, this goes back to precedent. Uh, this is, this is a, a business uh, endeavor, and I don't think it's appropriate for the city to be underwriting a business endeavor. As with any business, there is a certain amount of due diligence required if you're going to um, do it competitively, and I don't think, you know, the city provides notification that there are liens against, or it's a lien, at least one against the property, somebody to take that and then go look up exactly what those are in detail, I don't think is unreasonable. So, I, once again, I wouldn't support this. Thank you. Councillor Wilbur. Um, Councillor Earl kind of followed up on it, and, and having um, just been involved in purchase of property le recently, um, we had to check if there was liens. I don't work at a bank. I was able to Google how to do that, look it up, and find out if there was or not, and actually for free. What I find troublesome is that the memo states the purchaser was told there was a lien against the property. Now me, and I think probably most people, and I, and I would think that the purchaser um, would at that point then investigate what the lien is if there's other liens. So in purchasing the property, uh, the purchaser did so after being told there was a lien against it. And I have to agree, I do not think it is on the taxpayer's shoulders um, to rectify an error in not checking out all the facts before writing a check for property. And as Councillor Earl has said, it is a business endeavor. So, our, you know, I, I, it's really unfortunate, but I cannot support this. It, it, if you're going to purchase something, it's buyer beware. And if you're told there's a lien, you need to go verify that information. So I think the city did make the purchaser aware of the fact there was a lien. So it should have been looked into and not come back to council and expect taxpayers to purchase back property because the homework wasn't done. Thank you. Councillor Jebekov. Just one last comment <laughs> to do with disclosure. I, I haven't bought a house here for many, many years, but uh, just listening to people that have, there, there's a, a lot of emphasis on disclosure. Um, you, you have to let people know what you're dealing with. And I think disclosing the fact that there's $1.574 million lien is a fact that should be disclosed. Um, to, to not have that out there in the open, it, to me it almost seems uh, deceiving. So on that basis, I mean, you know, with all the legalities and all the opportunities that we have to 
to do uh, computer searches and everything else, it's the disclosure aspect that I'm looking at. It should have been disclosed. I mean, if you say, you know, there's a lien quietly and uh, somebody doesn't pay enough attention and the property sells and then all of a sudden <laughs> there's this huge liability, it, it just doesn't seem fair to me. Thank you. Councillor Parslow. There's some very good points that have been, been made and I'm, I'm listening to those. Um, if I was look at my crystal ball, I, if I was the buyer here and I've realized this, that um, I think I could safely say that the city will be having this property back in three or four years to uh, go back on the tax sale. And ultimately, then you're still faced with the situation three or four years down the road. But here you've got a property undeveloped with this massive lien against <coughs> it. And um, so eventually we're going to have to deal with it because um, I don't think this will happen again uh, for this property. It's now public knowledge about the 1.5 million. It will probably be back on the tax sale list in three, four years, and then what are we going to do? Duncan? So through your worship, um, sorry, through your worship, uh, we, we don't typically provide advice to purchasers, but in this particular case, the value of the property it was sold in a public auction. It's thirty thousand dollars. The lien is is good for the value of the property. There's a twenty thousand dollar surplus. The purchaser can approach the CRA indicating there's a twenty thousand dollar surplus. It's very possible they will remove those liens because that is essentially the value of the property minus ten thousand dollars. That would be on the onus of the purchaser to do that, um, but it's not uncommon. And speaking through our legal and understanding how this works, um, this this does happen. Thank you. Councillor Earl, one uh, more. Thank you, Your Worship, and I'll try and be quick. Just speaking to Council Parsler's point about a hypothetical scenario in which this property ends up back with the, back with the taxpayer in three to four years, uh, that's still very different than us purchasing it back. The difference between being a voluntary and involuntary keeper of this property, as Duncan mentioned, there's very different legal liabilities and obligations that come along with that. So once again, we don't have the option of simply refunding the money and declaring the, the sale null and void. We're actively purchasing the property and we're assuming the liabilities that come along with that. Whereas before, as just auctioning it off, we didn't. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments? Council, you had lots of discussion. So I'm going to add uh, to me the two things that are a significant concern for me um, are two now. We, we sold the property. Uh, through a public auction. We do declare that there are liens on the property. Um, but the two aspects that are the kickers for me now is we, we're, not, we're not just declaring the sale null and void. We're saying that we're buying the property back, which changes the liability for our residents, who now are going to take on that liability of a property that may be contaminated. As a tax sale, we don't. And uh, we're going we're gonna to have our residents uh, take up the $20,000 that's now held um, that we cannot uh, uh, do anything with but redeem to either the owner or the lien holder. So to me, those are two uh, issues that I don't know how the residents in the city of Dawson Creek can take on that accountability, that responsibility. So with that, are you ready for the question? to bring it back under mayor's business? No, it's a, it's a motion on here, so it's not. All those, sorry, so um, we have Mr. Jabs in the audience in, as a delegation. Normally we don't allow the delegation to address council unless it's through unanimous uh, agreement by council. And he's put up his hand, raised his hand to speak to it. Our council, are you uh, prepared to allow Mr. Uh, the delegation to address council? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. So just come to the table, uh, Ron, and Yes, I've uh, supported the city for many years in tax sales, and my uh, part of that deal was is I loved the interest the city paid compared to the banks, and I didn't expect to get a surprise package like this. Yes, I didn't 
look into the situation of the liens. I was advised that there might be a mortgage and a lien. I wasn't in, advised the amount of it. For the city to be selling that property with a government lien is breaking the law. So, <clears throat> I, the person... So, no, I'll just correct you there, because we can't do anything that's against the law, Ron. Right? Exactly. You just never notified the government that you're putting the land in the tax sale for $1.5 million over... There is that... So, I'm just, no, I'm just saying, we, we, city, could not do anything that's against the law. Our, our, this council, sure. our staff, would not allow us to do something that's against the law. So I just wanted to clarify that because you said you were, we were breaking the law. Now here's the other situation. I've been doing a pile of work in that property. <coughs> the property now has been bought from me, from my accountant. What a mess. I talked to the city lawyer, which I was advised by one of the staff here, and they told me that I am not liable for that debt but they could come and seize the land. Then the city had no right to sell in that land. I don't know what to do. Well, council, so thank you. We'll, we'll, uh, we certainly appreciate you coming this morning and uh, council have given their uh, opinion. And so now council will be dealing with. And I've also talked to I talked to Wayne Dahl and Mike Bernier and Alderman that are 100% behind me. And I'm not, for me to take this land, they're going to throw the liens against all my other properties. You know, if I would have known there was that debt against that land, do you think I would have bought it? I have lost interest. That's all I have to say. Thank you. <coughs> Council, um, we've had lots of discussion. You're ready for the question. All in favor? Opposed? It's defeated. Thank you. Uh, item 3.2, Councillor Parslow. Thank you. If I may, uh, just want to make a few comments about another topic, and then I'd like to visit the school district uh, one. I emptied my briefcase uh, on s Saturday to uh, access my computer and came across my notes I'd made at the UBCM. And one of the things that's sort of disturbing me is that any time somebody who's contributed an awful lot in the public sector uh, that through health has to announce an early retirement. And so I was a little upset about, uh, regardless of political stripe, you know, Andrew Weaver, who I really admire as an individual and what he's contributed, uh, had had a health incident and uh, did, was able to deliver a speech. I just want to make a few comments about what he said. Because I think, regardless of any political stripe we have, they, they resonate with with all of us, and I think we need these reminders, uh, especially when we're dealing with difficult situations, such as the one we've just dealing, dealt with and others that have to come. Uh, Andrew, in his uh, presentation, uh, really made a call that uh, municipal governments uh, really have a, the practice of, of looking for ev making evidence-based evidence decisions focusing their decisions on the long-term consequences, not the short-term gains, but the long-term. And I think that's a, a good mantra. Whatever we do, what is the long-term consequence of this? Some of the implications, as was articulated by some council members in the debate we've just had. He uh, basically pleaded for um, the uh, provincial government and municipal governments to focus their efforts on building a new economy. And to always ask yourself this question, I've heard this question stated before uh, by a, a First Nations leader while addressing a group of CEOs. 
He said to these CEOs, uh, your interest is uh, what's in the benefit of your shareholders. He said, our interest, Andrew would say, and his First Nations leader said, we need to think about our, what is best for our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. And I think that's a very useful mantra. Think about the long term, not what will just get you re-elected. I did go to a workshop, uh, just a few comments, this is a massive topic, on reconciliation. Um, I have some, one or two of us on council have talked about that, and I share some of the questions that my colleagues have on that. And so I asked at this uh, workshop, you know, how will we know that we've achieved reconciliation? When will we know that? In the discussion that followed, uh, I asked if there was any framework a community could follow in, in, as an aftermath of this Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report, where we could take some positive steps to, as following the call to be reconciled with uh, First Nations colleagues, friends, acquaintances. One of the useful things I, th I got from the answers from the group of people there is that it can't be a top-down process. It has to be a bottom-up process. It's really reconciling ourselves as fellow <coughs> human beings on this planet. But one th common theme that I resonated with me is reconciliation can begin until the truth about what has happened has been spoken and understood. And so there's an education process. I was privileged with my wife to work with the Narican Friendship Center over a number of meetings about a month or two ago. And they've got really good new leadership and uh, a powerful team there. And um, I've encouraged the leadership to talk to you, Mayor, because um, I know, you know your heart is in that, and uh, that maybe there's some things we can do jointly uh, with other partners, um, particularly in the education front, because without an awareness and understanding of what the truth is, uh, how can we move forward? So stay tuned, you may, may get a phone call about that. So that's all I wanted to say about uh, UBCM, and now we've got lots of items on our agenda. Um, now I want to move to transit. Um, I think it's very important that uh, the political body, which is the city council, uh, when dealing with purviews that are responsibilities of other elected bodies, we should have a head-to-head -head meeting. And I would like council to consider having a meeting with the school board trustees for School District 59 to talk about busing, in-town busing in Dawson Creek. A, to make them aware of our budget efforts the possibilities and the options and, and explore some of the options with them. And I'd also like us to find out how uh, busing um, or how students in communities like Chetwind and Tumble Ridge, how those students get to school where there is no transit system. So that's my request that we um, consider, we have a council to, to school board meeting to talk about busing issues. You're making that by way of a motion. I am. Seconder? Councillor Kemp? Discussion on the motion? Any comments? Councillor Earl? Um, yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I think uh, busing, in addition to a whole, you know, it's uh, probably long overdue that our two boards meet respectively and discuss areas of common interest, so I wholeheartedly support the initiative. Thank you. For the comments, Councillor Parsons. If I, if I, if I may, um, the, I, I'd like this meeting to happen <coughs> in short order uh, because we have some dates approaching. By other decisions need to be made, so I'm not saying when, but in short order. But um, 
I have been talking to people in the community about transit. They've talked to me. I have not initiated these discussions. <coughs> but using the figure of, of $7 a ride subsidy, which is a de facto what we are, are paying, um, I was challenged in one conversation to do some math. And I've shared the math with you just uh, earlier t this morning. Um, so if a, if a student rides a transit bus in the morning and afternoon, it's a $14 a day subsidy. When I was school superintendent, the kids would be attend actually physically attending school about 180 days a year. 180 times 14 is $2,520, $2,520 a student subsidy. As a result of another discussion, it came to my attention that that amount is more than the average homeowner pays in property taxes. It just, after the, after the homeowner's grant, right, uh, they actually pay out of their pocket. So we have a significant <laughs> financial <laughs> challenge to deal with. Well, I would just add, if you remove the school district taxes on the tax bill of resident pays, as well as the Peace River Regional, it's probably twice what average uh, homeowner pays in taxes to the city of Dawson. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Further you. discussion on the motion? Ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Parslow. Anything further? No. Councillor uh, Lexner? Sorry, new, new business? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll be quick. Yeah. Uh, just a couple things. No motions or anything, Your Worship. Just wanted to note that I attended the uh, board meeting for the Northeast Regional Community Foundation, which I'm liaison for the city. They are ramping up. Um, for those who don't know, that uh, community foundation includes Hudson's Hope, Taylor, Dawson Creek, Chetwind, and I'm not sure off the top of my head if Tumbler Ridge is in there. Um, so their endowment has grown to uh, just over $600,000. So they're looking to start uh, sending those funds out to uh, various initiatives throughout all those communities in short order in a much more <laughs> Uh, consistent and, and organized fashion than they previously had where they've kind of given out a bit but now the endowments grown to a point where they feel like they can sus do sustained giving and they're also going to uh, be beefing up their fundraising so that they can continue to grow that endowment so good news for them um, they got a Facebook page now if anyone's curious please follow them there and uh, secondly I just wanted to uh, congratulate the Nowakin Friendship Center they had a very successful open house on Friday I believe to uh, unveil their new renovations it looks great down there I think we got that sidewalk in at just the right time it really uh, compliments each other so uh, congratulations to them and as Charlie said their leadership down there is is they've got some new blood and they've got uh, they're doing some great work so good thank you Councillor Parzal can I ask a question of yeah. <clears throat> Do you know what what is the so the principal they have is six hundred thousand? The endowment, yeah. The, yeah. So how much uh, a year does that? Uh, should they just be able to apply well, the interest? Right? That um, so they're still uh, formulating some policies and guidelines around how much they can give away per year. But obviously, as an endowment that's invested in the market, it depends on the returns. So in a good year, you might have a bit more. In a, in a bad year, you might have a bit less. But the, the key is to grow that principle while still being able to provide some funds. But you know, if you have <coughs> um, you know, 5% growth in a year, that's 30 grand. 30, so thank you. Further, Councillor Lextrom and then Councillor Wilbur. Thanks, Your Worship. Just a couple of things I've noticed over the last little while. It's that time of year. But encouraging our business owners on occasion and I have to look to administration, the collection frequency for a business is determined by the business, I believe, if I'm correct, on the large containers. It's just what I'm starting to see is sometimes maybe that collection frequency needs to be addressed so that the garbage isn't blowing all over when our winds kick up. Uh, a lid half closed for three days in the city doesn't help anybody. It blows to your, uh, your neighbor, the business beside you or down the road. So really just a an ask of people that notice that in their own business, maybe rethink your collection frequency and get it done a day earlier or two if we could see that. I think it's uh, in our bylaws, but we'd rather do it by asking and, and seeing that. The other thing I've noticed, it's fall. Our leaves have fallen. And this is really no different, and I'll compare it to snow. I'm seeing more and more people raking their leaves out onto the middle of the road so that it can blow down the road to their neighbors so they gotta pick it up. 
Makes no sense to me. Not only that, it goes out and plugs our drains. That's the other side of this. So, uh, you know, I'm going to ask, it's a courtesy. I mean, don't rake your leaves to the middle of the road so your neighbor's got to pick them up. That just makes no sense to me. And with the snow coming, it goes with our snow too. People shovel their snow in their driveways and throw it in the middle of the road. I'm going to encourage our bylaw officers, and the people can think what they want, to ticket people that do that. It's just not acceptable. We're a community that is prideful in how we look, what we do, and how we treat our neighbours. Neither one of those is an appropriate thing to do, in my <coughs> and it violates the bylaw. The other one I'll just speak on today is voting day, federal voting day, get out and vote. Men and women served our country and fought and died for our right to live in a free and democratic society. So take your time, go out, cast your ballot. 60%, um, 70% turnout is not good enough in my mind. For the 30% or 40% that don't vote, don't raise a single issue to your elected officials because you give that right up if you don't vote. <laughs> you feel strongly about that. Yes, I do. <laughs> good sleep last night? Very good. <laughs> good There's job. my pillow. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Wilbur. So what Councillor Lexter said on voting, do that. Um, but thank you to those that already have, because there is a rise in the advanced polling, so good on that. Um, I did have a photocopy uh, given to all of Council and Your Worship and staff, I believe. And it's a letter from uh, the Dawson Creek Golf and Country Club. And so I'm helping um, Mr. Middleton and the group apply for doing the prep work to apply for an NDIT grant for some renovations to make their washrooms wheelchair accessible, which is phase one of a three phase project. Um, so if we could bring that up under mayor's business, I would like to put Can you make a motion we move to support Port. this? Councillor Earl, second. Discussion? All in favor? Most carried, so we'll bring it back under Mayor's business. Thank you. Um, and the only other thing I did mention earlier was the Cody system. Um, and uh, for those of you that don't know what that is, it's an interactive system for our physicians. And so it was put into emergency, um, as I said earlier, in Tumblr Ridge, Chetwin, and Dawson Creek. Um, and we tested it. So um, two weeks before it was launched here in the South Peace. Um, it was also made available to our nursing staff as well. So they can have paperwork done um, and it works very well um, in Tumblr Ridge or Chet Wednesday where they have to call the doctor in in the middle of the night. All the prep work and paperwork's already done on the system. So their feet running when they hit the emergency room. Um, and I will tell you the response from our physicians was overwhelming and they feel uh, very connected with each other, but also made a difference on some of those doctors that are looking to those larger areas that have those people in place. So when they did the calls, um, it literally took 30 seconds. There was an internist on the line, and so we did some test runs. And those internists, there's two that work on shift, um, and that's all they do. They're not in ICU. They're not working in a hospital. They're literally on shift uh, for the Cody system. So all of the physicians in the South Peace um, are getting their um, accounts and getting set up as well. Not only can they use it in the emergency room with the equipment that's there, the app also goes on their phone. So if they're in their office and they're having issues or maybe their patient's medication's not working out, they can also call from the app on their phone and they instantly have um, an internist there that can help them uh, with those issues. So I think it's a big step for our doctors. It's a great tool to have. Um, and the Health Society and our partners that came on board to help us do that, um, we're happy to do so. And I think when it comes to promoting our communities, it, that's just one piece of equipment we can say that we have. It's being done as a pilot project in other areas. Um, our area wasn't chosen for a pilot project, so we chose to just purchase it and um, have it. And so it will be there for when and can be moved to the new hospital when it's built. And, uh, our doctors are connected so and I think that's important you know um, we want to have those specialists and those people here but reality is as we've seen the education time and we're not pumping them out as fast as we would all like so this just connects um, all of our medical family here in the South Peace to those larger areas so I just wanted to put that out there and and uh, so the community knows that we're doing everything we can on doctor and nurse retention uh, for the region thank you Councillor Wilbur Anything further under Councillor Business? So we'll move to our, uh, we'll take a break, I guess it's 10.30, so we'll take a seven minute recess please.
back to order and uh, back to our agenda and we finished off at item number four minutes. Uh, so 4.1, the minutes of a regular meeting of council for adoption uh, for <coughs> October 7th. <coughs> Councillor Parswell, Councillor Wilbur. Any errors or omissions in the minutes? All those in favor? <coughs> Opposed? It's carried, thank you. Um, any business arising out of those minutes? Councillor Lexer. Your Worship, um, under 5-2 at the end, September 9th, and I know we have it coming up with the request from Lone Star. Uh, there was some work that you were going to undertake, I believe. I'm just curious, are you work I think you're in the middle of that process. Yeah, right so I think what yeah. we'll do is we'll, when we get to that item on our agenda today, the notice of uh, the request for reconsideration, of, we'll ask for a motion to discussion, for discussion. I'll update council and then provide some direction to that. Okay, all right, That's. I just wanted to make sure I was aware of that. And then, that's me. That was everything I had on business arising, Your Worship. Good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, correspondence, uh, item 6, 6.1. We have an uh, email from Jin Tsuang, uh, Senior Policy and Analyst from Ministry of Job, <coughs> Trade and Technology. Open for business awards. Councillor Lexner. Your Worship, maybe I'll move for discussion and then. Sure. Thank you. Second, Councillor uh, Earl. All in favor? Opposed? Carried? Go ahead. On this one, I think it's always important we put uh, every opportunity we get the benefit of our city, how we're doing things, what we're trying to do to make it a livable, workable city, one to do business in. Uh, it may be a, a suggestion that we work with our Chamber of Commerce uh, to work towards this and try and put an application forward for this recognition. And uh, with that, I would so move that we work with our Chamber of Commerce to uh, put this submission in. All right. Thank you. Second. Councillor Parswell. Discussion. Councillor Wilbur. Can we just add Love Dawson Creek to that as oh, well? Most definitely. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Duncan? So through your worship, this is, a, this is a program that we have applied for in the past, and so they're looking for a specific initiative. If you recall in the past, we did the uh, business directory, and we applied on that particular initiative. So they, mm -hmm. they'd like to know how unique in a creative way that we're uh, the council and the city have implemented to open the door for business. Okay. 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 So if there's any ideas in, or a particular project council would like to focus on as part of this, we would uh, would welcome that right now. Well, Go ahead. I mean, I would speak to it. There's so many things I can think of. I mean, one, the financial stability of the city. This council has looked to the future uh, to make sure that as we move forward, not just today, but five years from today, 20 years from today, we have a city that's an affordable place to live, affordable place for business to come and set up. Uh, we want to make it easy to do business in Dawson Creek. I think every day uh, through yourself, uh, Duncan, we work towards that with our uh, staff. But there's just, I guess it would be a wide range if there's a more clear focus that people want before. But overall, we do a good job every day. I think we can get better at what we do. But, you know, I'm pretty proud of our city, and I think most people would reflect that as well. So. Thank you. Councillor Earl? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Just uh, to come to Eastrom's point, um, I, I know it's not the flashiest piece of infrastructure, but the water reservoir, uh, doubling our city's potable water capacity. When I moved here in 2010, that was the year we had stage four water restrictions, I believe, and we had to, uh, industry was cut off for a time from accessing potable water. Uh, so I, I I just float in it. I don't know if it's the flashiest thing, but given the uh, impending uh, beginning of LNG and potential for increased activity, the fact that the city of Dawson Creek was as forward thinking as they were in building out that infrastructure to accommodate further uh, people coming into our community, but all, not only that, but industry itself, I think is something we're putting out there. Once again, maybe not the flashiest, mm -hmm. uh, but very much needed and likely going to pay huge dividends over the next however many years. Sure. Thank you. I, I can think of two things. Honestly, the <coughs> event sport tourism strategy that we've uh, uh, in, taken uh, on in terms of that uh, opportunity of creating and diversifying the economic drivers of the community and leveraging that partnership with our region uh, and the First Nations where now we've got uh, we're pushing some of those events out into our neighboring communities that's helping them as well and helping build upon that for us uh, is one. And the South Peace Health Society and to me the Health Society is one that's building upon that pillar of health 
and health care and how important that is for our community. I think it's really innovative in terms of what work that has uh, been taken on in regards to that of attracting health care professionals into our community to help build our community. So those are two to me that are kind of potential. Anything further? Any further discussion? So I think that'll give us some stuff to yeah, start bet. on and absolutely great. we'll work with uh, Love Dawson Creek and the Chamber to come up with some of those ideas that we can make a, a pitch to uh, for a nomination. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Uh, 6.2, we have an email from Ray Leanne Sch Schoenwald, a resident of Dawson Creek regarding <coughs> concerns about transit. Councillor Lexton. <coughs> With a little leeway, I think this is the type of information that we are going to garner as we move down the road. I think we would have some discussions with our public as we try and secure the future of what type of transit system we want. Um, so at this time, I'm not sure. I, I think I appreciate the input. I think they have taken the first step at uh, presenting to us, but I do think we'll have a broader engagement as we move this forward. So perhaps a direction that we receive it and uh, respond with a letter from the mayor thanking her for her input. It's exactly the information that we're looking to ob obtain and input from our residents. And uh, we encourage her to stay engaged as we uh, continue down the road of looking at a model. Because I think, honestly, I think it's worthy of uh, us responding to her, not just receiving for information is my view. Mm -hmm. Don't Moved by Councillor Wilbur, <laughs> second by Councillor Kemp. Discussion? Great idea. <laughs> Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, 6.3, a letter from Jack Hines, the director owner of Lone Star Nightlife in regards to the reconsideration of uh, application for change of hours. And if we can just have, a, at this point, a motion for received for discussion. Councillor Earl, Councillor uh, Wilbur, all in favor? Opposed? Carry. So we did uh, have some discussion about this at the last uh, meeting and, uh, <coughs> and it was part of some uh, discussion that we would reach out to, I would reach out to some of the other establishments in the community that are in the business of uh, service, serving uh, alcohol and the nightlife and all of that. So I, we started that, but I didn't, get a firm, I didn't get a firm resolution from council to direct me to do that and so what I would like today is if you can direct me to do that, and then we'll bring this letter, uh, this request for reconsideration back at the next meeting. Uh, I, Tab and I have been uh, working away at getting, I think we've got about eight or ten meetings set up with uh, the various establishments in town. I'll get some feedback, we'll collect that, and then bring it back to council at our next meeting so that we can have some input into this <coughs> as it relates to his request for reconsideration. So, um, so moved by Councillor Kemp that we direct uh, the mayor to get this uh, input and bring back the letter of re for reconsideration at the next board meeting. Second by Councillor Parslow, discussion. Councillor Lecter. Your Worship, maybe I, I think, I'm not sure we need this motion. I think we dealt with that. I thought it was dealt with and engaged at two meetings ago. That I mean, I'm happy to vote for it. It seems like a, mm -hmm. a motion we've already got, even in our minutes under 5-2 uh, at the end it states that that would be dealt with. So it, it, this just may be reconfirmation of what we're going to do, and I'm okay with that. We were just clarifying it because uh, it didn't seem like there was a clear motion by council, so that's the only reason we did it. So. Okay. Anyway, that it's, it's uh, kind of uh, in process, and I took that as direction from council, yeah. but from those, so we started away. But I, it's just more to deal with the request from Mr. Heinz for the reconsideration that we'll have that information back at the next board meeting and I'll have some additional information uh, for Council then. Councillor Earl. Thank you, Worshipman. Just for my own clarification, I, I think the uh, the approach that, I don't know if we got a resolution on it, but we were going <coughs> to look at amending the overall policy so we're not just accommodating one business with a license where we're looking to, if we're going to extend bend the hours, expand them for everyone. Um, and obviously the discussions you have with these business owners would be with an eye towards public safety and the uh, making sure we can maintain the integrity of their property so they're not at further risk from hooliganism, I guess. Absolutely, and I think that's part of the broader conversation about this whole thing, and it's not just for this, but for that overall picture. So that's why I'm going to reach out to eight or ten establishments, not just specifically the 
uh, nightlife, yeah. but the restaurants and those that service alcohol. Yeah. I've been waiting one year to use the word hooliganism at a meeting. By the Good way. job. Thank you. It fit in perfect. <laughs> Just a quick one. As you go through this process, Your Worship, would you plan to engage with the RCMP to get there? Traditionally, I'm going, but historically, they will make a, a I guess, a decision or a, a comment, say, look, we would support something like this. We wouldn't support this for different reasons. Uh, just, I would encourage you to engage sure. with Staff Sergeant, see what their take is on the impact of our policing. Sure. Although we're at full complement, and I know we will see that later, yeah. uh, we still have a number of vacancies which are called soft vacancies yeah. due to people out on leave. So. Well, that's a great co great comment today for Damon, who will be here at the committee of the whole. All right, we'll ask him, right? Oh, uh, Councillor Wilbur. I was going to say I think they did provide us some with the first uh, letter from yeah. the on the first one. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Good. And it was yeah. Thank you. The reason I raise that, Your Worship, is through the letter from the business owner, they indicate no issues in the letter have been brought forward. So if there's no issues but a perception of issues, that's different than re that's where I want to get yeah. that information. Sure. Good point. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Uh, at 6.4, we have a letter from. Uh, Diane Cal Calio from the uh, Treaty 8 uh, Tribal Association in regards to some work that they're going to undertake in regards to um, the uh, opioid uh, issue and, um, and exploring cannabis as some uh, alternative pain management options. And so they're looking for a letter of support from us in this regard. And if our organization is interested in lending support by committing, uh, I did a little bit of work, reach out, but I haven't had a chance to get to the uh, community action team uh, about it and some other stuff around that who deal with the opioid issue in our community. So um, I, I would be looking for if Councillor uh, to uh, approve a letter of support for the initiative and um, I'll take it on myself uh, behind that to get uh, to our community action team to see if there's any support that we could or uh, Infra, uh, uh, expertise that we might have through our own community action teams. Councillor uh, Earl? Uh, just a question, if you'll permit. Uh, with respect to the include exploring, can, what can you, <laughs> did they give a definition of what they meant by exploring? Because if this is going to be used for uh, medical treatment um, when it comes to exploring, I, I don't. I, I'm under the impression uh, that that would be best handled by clinicians in like controlled studies, not necessarily, um, you know, the, those, I, I don't know where the, the medical consensus exists on this and if this is maybe jumping the gun or what they mean when they say exploring, whether it's advocating for more research or actually rolling it out to people with substance abuse issues. Yeah, I, this is all we have at this point and it's just looking for that. I think the first piece is a letter of support for them uh, to continue this, uh, develop this work around it and, uh, and um, if our organization or if our community had any expertise or any information that might be of value for them as they move forward. But I, I can't answer that. Councillor Lecter. Thanks, Your Worship, and through you. Obviously an important subject, uh, not just for First Nations, but non-First Nations. Is it the intent, and I couldn't get, is there work on reserve or is this in community? Because if it is, I think we've got this, and I'd rather see, rather than do something on top of, I'd rather be inclusive, so that we're doing this as a community together, not as Treaty 8, Tribal has an opportunity to do. I think they have a great uh, ability to reach out to First Nations, but maybe we should look at doing it in conjunction with what's going on today. That's my only worry about layering on yet another. Yeah, and I think that's exactly the point to me is I, I got to get some in depth into what's going on in our community and what they're looking for. But the, the second paragraph or the first paragraph of the letter, while our priority is to the nations that work with Treaty 8, we would very much like to ensure that this education is available to everyone in the Northeast. And so I think they're looking to engage everybody and that's why they're looking to us as a community to say, do your community or your organizations may have some work that's already underway that might be of a benefit to help uh, be part of it and part of the support of uh, participating in the working group. 
but I just don't have enough information yeah. to answer that question. So. Councillor Wilbur? Um, I know that the opioid crisis group is doing some work around this as well throughout the province and I think um, where I read this coming from and knowing that the opioid crisis teams are doing that is connecting all the dots and bringing everybody together to do it more holistically as a whole instead of having everybody in little silos. So um, I'm happy to support giving them a letter of support and having you, your worship, reach out to the opioid crisis team and, and making those connections. So I think it's really a matter of putting all of our services together rather than each one trying to do it as a silo because that's where um, teams like the opioid <coughs> crisis team are finding um, difficulties is that they're kind of their own entity but yet they need to you know they're trying to branch out and work with other groups in the community so I think this is one step closer to um, having a holistic approach to a very serious situation. Sure. Thank you. Councillor Your Worship, I'm fully supportive of this, except I do think I would certainly love to have more information. I read the second paragraph as a <coughs> new venture. Treaty 8 is embarking on an exciting venture which aims to educate First Nations on responsible use of cannabis, as well as providing support to the communities in developing policy in relation to cannabis. To date, we've established our policy. It's always open for review, though, so it's that I encourage people. Um, but I just, I wished I would know if this was the intent was to come under a larger body versus set up a new body. That's the only concern I have with this. As I understand it, there is work ongoing in this field right now, and I'll speak to our community and region. Uh, Treaty 8 obviously is much broader, takes in from Fort Nelson, we'll say, to the border <laughs> to um, McLeod Lake. Um, but that, I just, I don't want to put a letter of support forward saying I'm going to support a whole other venture on top of one we've got going already. If the intent is to meld it and work together, I'm 100% in support. Okay. So, so we may need further clarification. <coughs> sure. Aye. So perhaps if uh, we want to do that, then if you just want to direct me to, uh, I'll reach back out to uh, Diane. Uh, the director of administration and I'll get some further information some further detail in terms of what it exactly is and then I'll bring it back to council. Mm -hmm. so, Councillor Parzal? Well some of the com comments that uh, Councillor Lepstam just mentioned provokes this question right? So, so Treaty 8 Tribal Association has always been my headspace its offices in Fort St. John. But really, Treaty 8, you, you see a sign as you leave White Court. That's Treaty 8. Mm -hmm. So does this encompass the entire Treaty 8, or is it just Northeast British Columbia? I don't know. Do they have an admin office? Is it decentralized by region? Uh, what are we getting into here? My assumption when I read this, <coughs> we're just talking BC, but Treaty 8 goes into uh, Saskatchewan, Northern Saskatchewan, doesn't it? In the Northwest Territories, so certainly in a large part of our world. Yeah, the Treaty 8 Tribal Association is only represented by the uh, seven or eight communities, seven communities, I think, in Northeast BC. I don't even think McLeod Lake are part of the Treaty 8 Tribal Association. Yeah, I'm not sure who's yeah. part of it. So, so yeah, the, the heading of the Treaty 8 Tribal Association so is, is um, the Fort Nelson. Profit halfway, Doy, Blueberry, Soto, Westmont. So it says here the Treaty 8 Tribal Association was created to provide advisory services to Treaty 8 First Nations. Mm -hmm. The purpose of achieving economic prosperity and a healthy environment. So. Mm. Councillor Javeka. Uh, just a question. When they're asking for support, what does that imply? Does that imply that we are. Uh, going to provide financial support in the future or uh, are they applying for a grant from <coughs> senior government or, or, or are we just it sort of there. Uh, giving them a moral support for, for the initiative? Yeah, they, the tr uh, First Nations Health Authority, a tripartite agreement signed by the federal government, provincial government and First Nations look after health care uh, for the First Nations communities and I would be my assumption and again just an assumption that they would be applying for some funding through the uh, First Nations Health Authority to be able to provide them with some 
uh, funding to be able to undertake some of this work that they're looking to do. It would fall within health, in my view. But again, that, I'm just yeah. that's how that's how they. Th th I didn't get that they were looking for any funding for us. They're looking for us to say, would you support this initiative, and would you be interested in participating in the working group if your organization has other means of support? And that's I took that as other means of support of expertise, information, or work that might have been undertaken in our community by organizations or groups that might be beneficial to it. Councilor Earl. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So the impression I get from listening to the various councillors speak on the issue is that we're all interested in the potential of this initiative, uh, but before we can commit on behalf of the city, we need a bit more information. So as you said, uh, I would at this time make a motion to, to ask you to follow up with um, Diane Kaliu, the exec or director of administration for the Treaty 8 Travel <coughs> Association, to try and get some clarification on some of the points raised here today and bring it back before council for the next meeting so we can, um, at that time, affirm or not whether to move forward with this initiative. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Kemp. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, 6.5, we have an email from Tara Moorhouse, Senior Transportation Analyst from the Ministry of Transportation on, uh, regarding Northern BC Transportation Option. Mr. Parzal. I move that we receive this for information. Thank you. Second? Councillor Javekov. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank Can you. Can I just add one? Yeah. To, to, to administration, there's an offer in that letter to, um, if you want printed copies. Um, many seniors I've speak to are not aware of this, this service and I'm just wondering if we can play a role in uh, either printing off or have a brochure sent to us that we can distribute to our various senior homes that we have or through Dawson Creek Society, Community Living, Spickers, Seniors Hall, uh, because there's, there's a pretty comprehensive service uh, that until I read this, uh, maybe I had some pre-knowledge of it, but it's quite quite comforted to see that there's this option here, all these options are here. So can we, can we initiate something so we can distribute this? That's a question. So this would, yeah, this would be a motion. Uh, we would have for discussion and, and move that, but it's been received for information, but uh, through Cindy, just procedurally, I think it's just a new motion. And and just the recommendation would be we can link these groups. Just direct staff to uh, provide these copies of this information to our various seniors organizations. So moved. Second, Councillor Lexman. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried, thank you. Uh, we we'll move to item 7, report 7.1. We have report 19160 from the finance manager regarding the 2019 annual risk update. Councillor Lexer. I'll move for discussion, Your Worship. Thank you. Second? Councillor Wilbur. All in favor? Opposed? Gary? Thank you. Go ahead. I move for discussion because I think uh, far too often we ask and receive reports from our administration that they put a great deal of time and effort into and we receive them for information and never get the chance really to say thank you. This risk assessment is, uh, I think, well done. <coughs> a number of issues that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in our city, not just uh, as a result of what we're doing today, but previous issues as well as future issues. So it is a good read for people, uh, if they're at all interested in looking at this, to see some of the things. It's part of our decision-making matrix that you take risk into consideration. It's extremely important. So I, the discussion I wanted to have was simply to say thank you uh, to our administration and staff for the work they do and for this report. Thank you. Very appropriate. Further comments? Further discussion? Councillor Parslow, then Councillor Earl. Yeah, there's a, a comment, I, some information I'd like around the flood as component here. Uh, the comment is that uh, the mitigation, the flood mitigation reserve was created. 
in 2018 with 500,000 allocated annually from operating funds for flood mitigation in coming projects. Um, so that's ongoing, but haven't we had to draw on that fund uh, for some other work related to this? In other words, we don't just have that money still there. I think we've used some of it, haven't we? In 2019, the allocation of 508,000 we are using for this uh, big project. Um, the consulting project that we are doing now, the mapping. So for the 2019 accumulated year, we would have 920,000 instead of a million. That's when we use it. Yes, we got a grant of 300 and yeah, some thousand. And we had 65,000 and then we top to be able to do the whole consulting. But this report doesn't um, include the additional five hundred thousand dollars that was allocated into a. Into yeah, the because normally we do the allocation at the end of the year, mm -hmm. so the portion of two thousand nineteen yeah. net, you happen in December. Yeah. So council will be heartened to know that the fund is almost a million dollars <coughs> for flood mitigation preparation, proper prior preparation. <laughs> There's some more to it, but I can't say it. Um, <laughs> any further comments? Any further discussion on the report, Councillor Earl? Uh, just a quick uh, note, not necessarily a quest, but the uh, the amount uh, with respect to uh, the increase in the insurance, uh, specifically one from the one provider year over year, and the the new raw water reservoir is uh, cited as as a reason. But I just. It was uh, interesting for me after all of the rigmarole we went through last year in cutting uh, about 1.3 or 4 million dollars from the budget and finding another 700 thousand dollars in additional revenue to see almost, uh, I guess, all, just under 200 thousand dollars of those savings eaten up in a one-year increase in insurance for the new infrastructure we built is uh, a little jarring, I guess, as we continue to move forward through this process. Uh, but uh, also to echo Councillor Lextrom's sentiments, it's a very good report and very interesting read. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Any further comments? Motion then, Councillor Lexton. I move we receive the report for information, Your Worship. Thank you. Second, Councillor Wilbur. Just all those in favor? Opposed? Carry. Thank you. Um, 7.2, we have report 19161 from the finance manager <coughs> regarding the consolidated actual to budget variance report for September 30th. Councillor Parzel. I move the report 19161 from the financial manager, re September the 30th, 2019, consolidated actual to budget variance report we received for information. Thank you. Second? Councilor Jovekov. All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Nobody wants to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Talked enough. 7.3, report 19163 from the General Manager of Development <coughs> Services regarding requests for quotations on our fuel and lubricant for 2019. Councillor Earl. Uh, thank you, Worship. I move that report number 19-163 from the General Manager of Development Services regarding request for quotations 2019-38 fuel and lubricant be received. Further, the Council award RFQ 2019-38 to Dawson Cooperative Union for the price of $316,800.98 based on the estimated quantities. Thank you. Second, Councillor uh, Kemp. Discussion? Duncan, any comments? Uh, through your worship, um, this, this contract has, has flipped back and forth. The co-op had it before North Peace and now the co-op has been successful in getting it again. It's not a large uh, dollar value, but it is competitive. Uh -huh. Seems it's a pretty competitive field and everybody was within uh, pennies to each other and uh, bid that big so that gives you confidence that um, they're being competitive. Uh, further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, 7.4, we have report 19164 from the accounts receivable <coughs> clerk regarding our tax sale result. You want Blair, Councilor Lackey? Your Worship, at this time I participate in the tax sale in the City of Dawes Creek through a company in which I own, so I will declare conflict and excuse myself. <coughs> Thank you.
Councillor uh, Parslow. I move the report 19164 from the Chief Financial Officer, the 2019 tax sale results we received for information. Thank you. Second, Councillor uh, Wilbur. All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. <coughs> Duncan? Can I just make a quick clarification as well? I was asked uh, just that Councillor Lextrom, not as an individual, but as a, a company, participates in the tax sale. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're good. You're okay. Good. <laughs> we were just talking about, yeah, <laughs> no worries. Coming back. <laughs> okay. uh, item 8, uh, uh, bylaws 8.1 are permissive tax exemption bylaw 4424 for consideration of adoption. So moved. Councillor Parslow moves. Second, Councillor Kemp. Councillor Parslow, go ahead. Uh, it's okay. Just we'll deal with this. Probably. Okay. <laughs> Move for adoption. Ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed? Carry. Thank you. Uh, 8.2, we have report 19167 from the Deputy Corporate Officer regarding our cemetery amendment bylaw 4427 for first and first three readings. So Councillor Wilbur, move. <coughs> Second, Councillor Kemp, discussion. Ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Um, item 9 is Mayor's business. Uh, so part of the role at the PRD, you get uh, some additional opportunities at, at training and so we had emergency management training about two weeks ago for elected official. Uh, it was very well done. It was really good. It was really good to raise that awareness of how important that emergency management training is for elected officials and certainly we experienced that in 2016 with the flood and declaring a state of emergency and all that goes with that and all of those aspects to it. So it was really good uh, training for me to participate in and I found it very useful and um, had had a really good turnout by the regional uh, district directors and uh, appreciated the uh, training that had put been put on. Tourmaline uh, in announced a 1.7 million dollar 1.7 billion dollar uh, uh, investment for the future of their Gundy assets. Now I had a question about that and Gun their Gundy assets are north of. Um, Ha halfway up around mile 101. Mm. Uh, when it, whenever the oil companies sometimes use these terms, Gundy, for some people think Gundy, Alberta, yes. and the Pooscoopy field is over in Gordondale, and so it gets a little bit confusing. And so the Gundy assets that Termaline have <coughs> built is a deep cut facility. They're adding 100, uh, 200 million uh, processing capacity into it. And deep cut means they're getting into some of the carbons at the lower level, the stuff that just doesn't strip out. And so that, that's the propane, it's what they're after. They got a partnership with Altigas. Altigas built a export facility on the railway line uh, with uh, just north of Fort St. John. And so they're loading that, um, they ship the propane over uh, in a pipeline uh, to the uh, load facility for the rail cars. And then it's shipped by train to the Altigas export facility in Prince Rupert that was just opened earlier this year. And um, so they're really excited about it. It's turned into a really good asset for them. Lots of strong liquid production. They've got a great partnership <coughs> with the uh, First Nations, the Halfway, and uh, it's been very positive. They're really excited about the future that that holds for them. And certainly they've got a ton of assets in the Tower uh, Parkland, Farmington area as well that are also been very strong for them. So I went up to the event. Um, and Minister Mungal was there and uh, the Friday, Saturday of the long weekend and they took us for a helicopter tour. There was about a dozen of us on the bell that went for a tour and uh, it's really good to see it and really good to be there to support them in terms of how important the development of that is for our region. <coughs> um, I sit on the our regional community liaison committee for um, the site C development and they organized a tour of Site C for us uh, last week and uh, took the opportunity to get on the site and, and it's amazing. The diversion tunnels are uh, now uh, being uh, completed with the concrete being installed in it and the uh, work on the, um, on the uh, dam itself with the uh, coffer dams that will begin to divert the dam of the water into the uh, diversion tunnels during uh, construction of the dam itself. They're working on the powerhouse uh, 
and all of the uh, work that's going on there. It's like it's crazy how big a project and how much is going on there. I think the camp now at Sightsee is up to about 1,800, 1,900 people. It's it's a major, major uh, event going on uh, up there, and and uh, it was really interesting to see it and talking about all of the various components of the construction and seeing it uh, was really worthwhile. So, any question? Uh, was at Central School on Friday and uh, always look for this opportunity to engage with the kids and uh, so they had about five or six questions, two classes. I think they were about grade eight kids, maybe grade nine. I guess they'd have to be at Central, wouldn't they? Because yeah. that's, yeah. yeah. That's anyway, um, it was really good. The kids had some really good questions about democracy and the different levels and with the election coming up, uh, my views on that in terms of uh, the various reasons why it's important for us to be involved and stay attuned to the election federally or provincially for us as a municipality and how important that can be for us. And uh, so anyway, I had a, had a great hour uh, with the kids at the school and um, always, always enjoyed it. And somebody made the point, or I think Blair did earlier about, you know, Remembrance Day is coming up soon and we wear that poppy. Um, we wear that poppy uh, to, to remember uh, the people who gave their life for us to have the freedom to vote. And I always talk to the kids about that. That's why it's important. We have a, the greatest country in the world, I think, in terms of having the freedom and democracy. And we should be always celebrating that importance of us, how we get to vote. Uh, so we encourage everybody today to leverage that opportunity that people gave their life to, for us to have the opportunity to vote. Um, we have two delegation requests that we need to deal with uh, now. We had the request from the uh, Gay Strait Alliance of the South Peace uh, High School uh, requesting us to fly the pri pride flag for that week ahead of November 2nd. So we'll look for a motion. Councillor Wilbur? I would move that we grant their request. I think we've done this in the past and it makes kids feel good, so let's do it. Thank you. Second? Councillor Kemp? Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. And we had a request uh, from Councillor Wilbur brought forward the golf course, Dawson Creek Golf and Country Club, looking for a letter of support for a grant application to NDIT. So we have the motion brought forward. Ooh. Uh, seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Um, Your Worship, on that, can I just make a comment? I, I was asked by one of my colleagues if people in wheelchairs could actually golf, and the answer to that is yes, they can, and there's a special golf cart made that holds the wheelchair and then swings them out so they can hit that better than anybody else. So yes, people in wheelchairs can golf. And further knowledge for you, those people that are quadriplegics and run things with a straw can actually hunt as it's hunting season with a sif and puff, puff rifle. So we've come a long ways in technology. Thank you. Um, item 10, diary, anything? Nothing to update, Your Worship. Consent calendar, we've got a couple items. Motion for approved consent. Councillor Wilbur, second. Councillor Kemp. Oh. All those in favor? <laughs> Opposed? Carry. Uh, strategic priorities, Duncan, anything? Nothing to update, Your Worship. Media? Any questions? No, thank you. Thank you. So, Committee of the Whole. <laughs> uh, I don't know if the RCMP have been in contact. Are you, <coughs> are you used to us not getting around to until about two and a half. This probably stuck at Tim Hortons. So they're on their way, they're not okay. quite here. So we'll move to 14.2. We have the report from our deputy corporate officer. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. How is everybody this morning? Awesome. Superb. All right, it's been a while since we've done a Committee of the Whole with summer going on, so catch up with some of our issues and topics that we're working on in our admin department. Uh, corporate filing system, I've been working on that with Filet uh, Records Consultant. He was here in September to go through some of the, pro the, the process that we're, that we're offering. So we'll see how staff would take that to see if it will work for everybody. Uh, so we're working on that right now, and I have the analysis uh, book to come up in March, and she's going to go through the admin department to start our pilot project, and she will be up in May for a week to help us start convert our records. 
Uh, we have uh, <coughs> many items that went through tender process since the last community of committee of the whole, and they're all updated on there. The trade show for 2020, we're looking for council direction to provide a theme for the trade show booth for next year. So if council has any ideas, we would gladly accept those. And we have uh, community awards. Nomination is now open. The deadline is closing October 28th at 4.30 p.m. So information is on the website if people would like to nominate anybody in the community for one of these awards. I recently attended the Corporate Officers Forum in Prince George, and uh, there was a lot of very informative presentations from Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and a lot of uh, different information from Young Anderson that was very informative. Uh, Dawson Creek Municipal Public Library Board expression of interest is uh, we've, we're looking for two positions on the board right now and applications will be received until October 31st. Again, that information is on the website if you'd like to apply. Uh, a lot of our staff have been undergoing different training, so we're looking at succession planning and hopefully they will find their niche in the department and continue on. And some wonderful highlight news and notes, uh, <coughs> Melissa Love and her husband have had a beautiful baby girl that was born in September and we have yet to meet her, but I think that the cold and flu season is uh, delaying that. So we also welcome Terry Laguerre, who has taken Melissa's place for maternity leave coverage. So she will be here for until next August. Thank you, Cindy. Questions, Councillor Parzel? Well, just to enliven things a little bit, um, <laughs> I'm just going to su <laughs> make the suggestions uh, for Cindy. Uh, this trade show. What about having a theme? Uh, this comes from Andrew Weaver. Building a new economy free from fossil fuels. Would that be a good theme for our trade no. show? No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall the mayor giving you permission to speak. Do you want to go on a road show? <laughs> <laughs> I said I'm just trying to. I encourage everybody that doesn't want to use fossil fuels to not use them. Start <laughs> 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 on a, on a, on a, Attainable note, can I ask a few questions about this comprehensive list, uh, just sure. to refresh my memory? The, so the, thanks for the bullets here. The very last one, 2019-42, uh, um, Building Condition Assessment, NAR, Northern Alberta Railway, sta is that the station? Yes, the yeah. museum and the art gallery and the smaller buildings that are on site. Okay, well the museum, wasn't all that work, you know, new foundations, new, a large amount of money was invested, right? The, so what is that work, is it work as it relates to the railway station? So through your worship, Ross is, is quarterbacking the building condition assessment, so maybe you can speak to the work that's taking place. In this. Thank you, through your worship, yes, we're, we're doing a, a current two-day condition assessment on all of those buildings. Um, including the HVAC, electrical, structural status of each of those buildings. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I mean the short answer, sorry, the, the art gallery itself did, ex you know, we had extensive work on the grain tower and the art gallery on the exterior. And There's the foundation. And the foundation. Yeah. There's still a very historic or archaic uh, electrical HVAC. There's other work to be done. Okay, so this, is this all part then of that um, comprehensive city inventory whereby we're updating our, I guess, life Cycle. longevity yeah. of all our buildings, right? Now the airport has not, facilities, no work has been done on a building assessment for those at all, uh, in the past, has it? So, through your worship, there's, there's been... Um, smaller reports done in certain areas so for instance we did some boiler work in the tower and we've had other smaller projects we're really trying to wrap it in similar to what infrastructure has done with master pavement condition plans or i might have got that wrong or drainage plans it's really to wrap in uh entire buildings and kind of map it out and this stemmed really from the arenas when we did that uh review of the uh kin arena memorial arena in the curling rink and mapped out kind of the next 15 years worth of projects. So 
following along those lines, we're now getting into other buildings. We've done the fire department. Uh, we've been through the multiplex, I believe. So we're kind of working our way through our buildings to put together that comprehensive capital plan. Okay, thank you. I'll return to this topic yes. after Kevin's uh, sure. session. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. You got four words. <laughs> Just a, a couple of quick questions, Cindy. Thanks yep. for your report. Under policy review, on the first uh, tag, carbon fund and offset purchasing policies were referred to staff to provide uh, implications regarding repealing it. I thought during our budget discussions last year we did not go forward with purchasing offsets as part of our policy originally stated. Is that not correct? Or? So through your worship, <coughs> we did purchase offsets. How, however, we not this or sorry, we didn't purchase offsets. We applied for the grant. Sorry for the gas tax. However, we didn't purchase offsets. So we were net about one hundred thousand dollars, I think. Yes. To the good. Yeah, this policy Thank review. You came up after the budget yes okay so there's that one the other one trade show I mean in all seriousness when we look at it I do think we want to talk about I'll throw this out and focus on the financial picture of our city so people get an understanding as we go through the next number of years I think there's going to be people who wonder why we're making such difficult decisions it may be worthwhile that we start putting forward at least as part of our booth the reasoning uh, we're talking close to seven million dollars out of operations over the next seven years. That is a huge, significant undertaking uh, in this city and it is going to impact services. So I think we, we don't want to catch people off guard. The whole idea, if we as a council, I learned this a long time, go to fix a problem that the population we represent doesn't know is a problem, you're into a tough, a much tougher situation. But. I would suggest we talk about that as part of our uh, approach at the trade fair. That's it. Thank you. Anything further for Cindy? I I'm going to come up with funner ideas. Thank you, Cindy. <laughs> funner ideas. <laughs> sounds like a laugh. Our next, uh, I see the RCMP are here. Um, <laughs> it's more in love. Yes. yes. Good morning. 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 Welcome. Welcome. Are you still Okay. So quarterly report for June 1st to September 30th, 2019. Did you all receive the copy? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we'll start off with resourcing. Uh, we currently have Currently, no hard vacancies. We're rather the uh, detachment is surplus to establishment of one position, just awaiting uh, the outgoing member to sell his home. Uh, we currently have eight soft vacancies. So, soft vacancies are uh, members that are either on maternity, pat leave, sick, uh, injured, or on administrative duties. Uh, we anticipate hopefully three by the end of the by the end of this year that would be back to full duties. And I'm not sure. If, I don't think it was in the report. But I think the province has uh, funded Dawson Creek for an additional two members. I'm not sure if that was in there. So hopefully, we're that those will be recruits coming out of Regina in the new year, January, February, we're hoping to get those members here and trained up. Uh, crime trends. So while, while the crime is in the city is relatively on par with last year, uh, crime in the rural area has decreased at, uh, at approximately 5%. Largest decrease in crime has been noticed in the area of vehicle thefts. Uh, a decrease of 34% from last year. And this can be largely attributed to the bait car program we have in place here, but also to the RCMP's detachment's identification and monitoring of known offenders, plus a couple prolific offenders that are currently in custody. It sure helps us. Uh, the largest increase can be noticed uh, in thefts from vehicles in which we have seen an 89% increase from last year. 
So very rarely have we seen offenders uh, force their way into vehicles to commit these th thefts. Typically the vehicles that are involved have been left unsecured. So they just open the door, away they go. Um, many times with the uh, valuables left in plain, plain view. A uh, change of this behavior is required to curb this, this step and it is important for residents to secure both their homes and their vehicles and removing their valuables from the vehicles. <coughs> the RCMP detachment is uh, taking several proactive steps to address, <coughs> address this. Uh, one is it's conducting public town hall sessions to alert residents as to what they can do to lessen the chance of being a victim of property crime. Uh, this includes topics such as locking your doors, ensuring ad adequate illumination at night, and removing the valuables from within the vehicles. Uh, what's happening is a spot initiative. Uh, so throughout the winter, we're going to be conducting foot patrols in certain designated areas where there's large foot traffic and we're going to go and open cars see if there is anything and then if we do if we spot one we're going to leave them a, a note or pamphlet on their windshield letting them know uh, so it makes them aware uh, also it's visible that we're going to be throughout a neighborhood um, so hopefully that will deter some of the property crime. And uh, conducting proactive releases through the media to encourage residents to do their part by locking their doors and whatnot. And to date we've uh, written 465 reports to Crown Council for charges. Uh, that was 484 from last year. So we're down a little bit. So in closing, while property crime continues to be a, an issue within Dawson Creek region, a large uh, contributing factor continues to be homes and vehicles left unsecured. Uh, it is estimated that 90% of thefts from vehicles occur from the vehicles that have been left unsecured, while at least 50% of vehicle thefts are a result of keys having been left in the vehicle. So this attributes to taking a fob or something to the garage door, or unlock in your home. Uh, we need a change in this, in this behavior to the public. Um, Dawson Creek are, are targeting the offenders responsible for property crime in our area. Uh, recently, four people or four persons were arrested and charged for a variety of pri property crime related offenses. This investigation continues and it's anticipate, anticipated that more of the charges are forthcoming and identify. Uh, others that are involved. So. Question? Good. Thank you. Councillor Earl. Thank you, Worship. So just uh, one question and a couple quick comments. Um, <coughs> just for, for my own volition and, and maybe some of the other councillors, could you give a bit more detail on what exactly the prolific offender management program entails? I'm not entirely sure. Okay. Well, that, that that can be for another time. And I know just uh, one comment I often <coughs> hear from people is a frustration at you guys catch people, they're charged, and then they kind of, when it gets to the courts, it uh, loses all sense of urgency, all, you know, and, and people are, the, the revolving door argument, I guess, people are often frustrated with. So I'd just like a bit better understanding of this program and how that can hopefully uh, help curb some of that. Uh, second point, the soft vacancies. I understand it's not the local detachment's issue or fault. I appreciate that we've uh, been able to fill the hard vacancies and uh, the fact that we're receiving another two regional, it's regional Pro detachment. Provincial. Yeah, provincial. provincial is uh, always welcome news and certainly for our rural residents and here in Dawson Creek. Uh, I know, and I wasn't there, but I understand at UBCM we had the opportunity to speak with the RCMP about getting some programming in place to help with those soft vacancies and, and uh, maybe having a floating talent pool that can fill in because, um, you know, as much as we appreciate your efforts, losing a third of our force 
um, and not having any any way to backfill that is is incredibly frustrating. I'm sure it's frustrating for you guys as well. Oh, yes. Through yeah, so um, <laughs> yeah, not 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 your uh, your fault necessarily, but it becomes a <coughs> problem by extension. Um, and then lastly, uh, the point you made about people uh, property crime and the result of it, uh, the majority of it being for people not securing their property or their vehicles. Um, yeah, uh, as much as we'd all love to live in a world where we didn't have to lock our doors, that's just not how it is at the moment. Um, and I just ask any members of the public who are paying attention to uh, think of how much of our local law enforcement resources are being, you know, and, and credit to you guys for taking the time to walk the streets and give notices to people, but uh, I just highlight to our residents, for every man hour our local RCMP detachment spends doing that is a man hour they're not out dealing with other potentially more serious offenses or they're not able to dedicate to uh, proactive, you know, various other initiatives, drunk driving, uh, assault, things like that. So, um, no, I you my full support in that, and if there's any, any way I can help, certainly. Thank you. Councillor Lexford. Well, thank you. Councillor Early, you covered a number of mine, but again, I'll to talk about the, uh, when we look at your report, and I'll go to the theft from vehicles and comment briefly on that, but I'll start with mental health. A very positive to see a 17% decrease uh, in those reporting incidents, as well as a clear focus and we've spoken before about this, the business side of B&E has gone down as well, which is welcome news, I think, for all of us. I share the concern the Councillor Earl raised, and certainly you expressed, that theft from vehicles in the ma vast majority either have the keys in or the doors are unlocked. A number of years ago, uh, there was a decision made, we're not going to attend, or RCMP is not attending minor fender vendors, for example. Is there an effort we could put in place? It makes no sense to me that, uh, particularly if a vehicle is unlocked or keys in it, why the RCMP would even take their time to go? It's a tough risk you're taking if you don't lock your doors. Or, but if you go out, you determine that that's the case, maybe there's a way we can charge them for your time. Because the general taxpayer is kick, picking up the amount of money it costs. And policing and protective services is a substantial cost for any city. It, it just is horrendous that we've got this going on when the taxpayer is saying, geez, I lock my doors and I don't have to uh, have somebody come out and look because somebody stole a stereo out of my car or whatever it is. But what are your thoughts on that kind of approach? I agree. Uh, some of That's it all is I need. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Some of it is uh, you leave a wallet. So now their identity is stolen. Um, they may have a passport. On the passports are left in their vehicles. Uh, so certain things we do, we will attend. A lot of it is, yes, it's front counter. Um, yeah, I got this broken into, or this was stolen last night. Yes, it takes time to uh, address it. Either add some of the items on CPIC to make sure that if it's found, like, could be anything, but theft of stolen items, uh, like tools, be it whatever. They run their serial numbers, or they have their serial numbers. We still have to add that to CPIC, in case down in Prince George they pick it up and run a serial number, oh, okay, now we can get this stuff back. Okay. So it's data, <coughs> more of data entry. Uh, it's not necessarily going to okay. the homeowners or vehicle owners to take a look at the vehicle, live fingerprints, be whatever it is, but we don't do a lot of that. All right. There's no, no real need to do that. A lot of them have uh, gloves on or be whatever. <coughs> but it's a lot of, it'll be a lot of data. You still have to type up file. It uh, takes 15, 20 minutes to gather yeah. the information. So it does take time. Right. And when you have, you know, what is it, 89% more than last year, that's, uh, that's a lot of files. Very significant. Thank you. Councillor, any further questions? Councillor Javekla? Uh, I was just wondering about that SPOT initiative. Is that going to be targeting areas around town that have been identified as, uh, you know, prolific <coughs> theft areas or? Yeah, where I said it's more foot traffic. So downtown, uh, I know, I think just north 90, 95th. Certainly we have little hot spots yeah. throughout town. So we'll be doing those areas. 
Uh, is that starting soon, or it is. We are you waiting till winter till there's a bunch of snow in the ground? It's easier to see their footprints. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, just, we have some. We have uh, pamphlets that are being printed, so we're just waiting on them. Right on. <laughs> and that's you know that's, that's to help us the residents seeing that we're visible throughout there. You know, we will walk around, maybe even during the day. Like, there's a hockey game going on. There's a lot of vehicles just to mm -hmm. pull the handles. And, well, thank you, Brian. Appreciate you being in this morning and uh, the update and great news about the provincial uh, nomination of those uh, two officers for us. That's so, <coughs> like soft, like I say, soft vacancies. We get two or three back. Yeah. Sweet. Good stuff. Cool. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Appreciate it. Uh, Fourteen three. We have a report from our chief financial officer. Good morning. Good Welcome. Morning. Thank you. Mike. Am I you're your bringing a little bit echoing. Yeah. Nice to have you here today. Thank you. Um, regarding to the report, I think uh, I just want to emphasize about the budget, 2020, where we started there was a budget as as assumption in, uh, in the last meeting. Although you've been working since uh, July uh, with the management team to combining data to start to work for the draft one that you'll be discussing on December 16. Uh, and also something new, uh, we have a survey that uh, is online and also we have a, in a paper version where we are asking uh, the residents to come with their suggestions and comments about uh, this uh, New Year's budget that we are uh, is starting. Um, we're going to have our first uh, public hearing today at 1 p.m. It's uh, something new for us here. Uh, but the idea really is to open the microphone to the residents where they can come with questions about the process, uh, about the strategic plan that council has uh, in place. So that's it. We are, our department's working hard on the transition of the banks. Uh, Michelle has been working pretty diligent on that. Uh, the interim audit is started this week, so we have the auditors here. We have the cemetery compliance auditors uh, on October 9th, so we are waiting for the results of this audit. And uh, I just would like to say about my team, um, we have a new member, Miranda, um, that joined as a financial a finance coordinator, <coughs> and lastly, that was our cash clerk. She's moved now for accounts receivable, and Tanya, uh, which has been working very hard uh, in the last uh, 24 years with excellent custom service, uh, high ethics, um, that she's been in our tax department for a pretty long time. So she's leaving us, and her last day is uh, November 1st. So I want to use this opportunity to thank her very due diligent uh, professional mm -hmm. that uh -huh. we had for many years in our tax department. Mm -hmm. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Flavia. Any welcome. questions? Councillor Parzel? Yes, well, I certainly echo what you said about Tanya, outstanding person. Um, yes, so as Councillor Letstrom stated uh, some five to ten minutes ago, uh, about uh, reducing our operating budget by seven million over seven years, approximately. So I am anticipating that uh, we will be uh, cutting our operating budget by a million this year. Um, when will we s receive some information as a council about how that's going to be achieved? So we will be doing the draft one presentation as a result of the combined data we are getting from the managers now. So from there, we're going to be able to show where the cuttings are starting. And then that's where the discussion is going to be. Although, um, I don't think. Yes, can. so to your worship, this is where our strategic priorities and our focus for 2019 mm -hmm. come into play. So council has some decisions to make in the, in the four areas that have been identified. And that's where the brunt of our staff time at work is <laughs> has sat right now. Yep. Well, my concern about that is yes, there's been four areas identified, and um, 
we know if, if we just take the transit uh, that that contract that is currently in place will stay in place until June. Uh, so any sa so what's on the cards with those four is hardly going to uh, achieve a million dollars. So I want to know what are efforts are uh, administration taking to help council achieve the million dollars uh, operating cuts. Uh, so just uh, just I'm just going to jump in because I don't think we've I don't think we've yes. said uh, council hasn't given any direction that exactly. there's going to be a million dollars in operating cuts this year. There's been no direction that there's going to be a million dollars in cuts. We we're working on those strategic priorities through the budget, and we've set a seven-year time frame in, two, in terms of where we're getting there. But I, I just I think we've got four strategic priorities that we've set, and that's what we're working. Yes, and uh, your ship. Uh, so, in the uh, budget assumption report, we stated an average of a million. If we would consider an average annual in the next seven years, is one million. But either on that discussion, I think uh, you um, brought to the attention. Said, Look, we didn't set an amount. We have seven million to reach within seven years. Can be 1.5 million now, or can be um, like five. 500,000 now and 1.5 next year. So there is not a fixed amount. But what we as a staff are going to do, we're going to bring to the table on, on December 16 what we found so far, what we, what we identified. And then from there, compared to the capital allocation of PRA, because that's one of the key concerns. And then council can come with further decision. And I just want to clarify that as well. We also had other uh, new revenue opportunities that have been identified in there that are also yeah. a part of that overall strategic priority. Councillor Earl. Uh, no, I just can reiterate your point, Your Worship, but the seven million dollars wasn't <coughs> explicitly in cuts. That was seven million out of. We're getting. Uh, yeah, sorry. sorry. We're, get we're getting it to some uh, flat stuff here in terms of a budget that's outside yeah. of the financial so, plan here. And we're going to no, have, yeah. we're gonna have some uh, budget discussions. So. Nothing to add to the report, though. Thank you, Flavia. It's very good. <laughs> Thank you. Anything further for Flavia? Great job, Flavia. <laughs> Thank you. We're turning the heat up two degrees. <laughs> General Manager of Community Services, good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Your Worship, members of Council. Um, in terms of community uh, community services, and, and in addition to the uh, the data contained in the uh, in the uh, Cal report, I'd like to touch on a couple of uh, different items contained in that report. Um, earlier this spring, the city uh, or the fire department uh, purchased 18 Scott site in mask thermal imaging cameras. I know that's a mouthful, but gives the firefighters the opportunity to see through the dark when they're in the fire. Um, the camera, the total purchase for those cameras was $27,661, which was well under the 29 approved capital budget of $55,000. Just wanted to note that in addition to the, the good purchase there, the city did receive an additional um, two grants in support of this purchase, one from Pembina Pipeline, who, do not, who donated $3,000, and Alliance Pipeline, who donated $5,000. So those donations further offset the quoted price by approximately 30%. So good savings there on the fire department. Earlier this year also, uh, council approved the donation of age turnout gear to Firefighters Without Borders. At the time, council did ask for some further information, and there is considerable detail contained in the report. But in addition to just touching on this, this was a group that was formed in Vancouver, a group of firefighters who in 2008, on their own dime, uh, took some donated uh, equipment, including three uh, trucks, old trucks, and some turnout gear, and uh, made, made their way to El Salvador to donate that gear. The Firefighters Without Borders group has since uh, grown um, considerably in that period of time and is now a Canadian national organization. Um, further investigation uh, with respect <coughs> to our gear that was donated has as, uh, indicated that the equipment that we donated went to the Philippines. I don't believe that donated equipment we have any a uh, means of asking or suggesting where that might go. I think that's done by the organization. Um, 
in terms of our own donated turnout year, according to WorkSafe BC, uh, manufacturer recommendations for replacement must be adhered to and replaced every 10 years. So this is virtually legislation that would suggest to us we need to, we need to get rid of that equipment every 10 years. A full set of gear consists of helmet, pants, coat, and boots. Uh, the City of Dawson Creek firefighter uh, utilize about, utilizes about 35 sets of gear um, at the local station and approximately four sets of that gear are replaced every year. Um, again, typically that would be sent to our own landfills. Um, the old turnout gear is not useful to other BC fire departments as they are governed by the same legislation that we are. Um, so that, there is some more detail on there, but that's it, that, that one in a nutshell. In terms of safety, we still continue to focus on achieving the Certificate of Recognition from WorkSafe BC through the BC Municipal Safety Association. Uh, however, before we can go forward and finalize our core certification, we are working actively, the, the safety department is working actively to audit our own safety system. So that means going through our own processes and protocols <coughs> and, just and ensuring that we're meeting uh, the appropriate levels there. Um, there have been a number of changes uh, in our reporting structure, in our committee structure within our, our safety, and we are starting to see uh, a shift in the culture in that we are seeing uh, many more instances reported, uh, near misses reported, we're able to investigate, and the whole idea behind this is just to ensure that we are uh, correcting certain behaviors and, and, and things of that nature. So we're seeing some real changes, we're collecting those stats uh, and doing a good job, Inca is doing a good job with his team in that department. Uh, we did complete annual audiometric testing October 7th and 8th, which is an annual testing that we take place or that takes place within the city. So I just want to touch briefly, typically I focus on, uh, we go, this would be firefight, uh, firefighters and safety. I did want to touch on our uh, aquatic center, the Ken Bork Aquatic Center, uh, for now for a couple of years has offered uh, a sponsored summer free swim. Um, our total attendance through the months of July and August was 20,171 visits or visitors, which is up from 19,418 in 2018. Our typical attendance in, in previous years without that free swim has been between 10,000 and 15,000 visits. So certainly it's, uh, it's a great opportunity that the local citizens are taking advantage of. Um, Approximately 3,300 of the 2019 attendees were adults who did have to pay uh, admission uh, through the summer months, and that equated to about uh, almost $13,000. So most of you have uh, have uh, seen that we we uh, we introduced and advertised for an apprentice aquatic program um, at the city of Dawson Creek. We were certainly struggling with staffing and we thought in terms of succession planning, why not go out and let's try some of that ourselves. So we offered to advertise for an apprenticeship program whereby uh, the city would actually fund the training uh, to become a lifeguard and, and furthermore to become an instructor and ultimately at the end of the day uh, create some uh, succession planning and some, some potential new staff members too fill some of these positions. Where our challenges are really are lying or uh, you know, kind of the midweek, Tuesday morning, Wednesday afternoon that, that somebody, you know, part time maybe is working two jobs and can't do. So um, the apprentice lifeguard instructor position, we did receive uh, 19 applicants and I should back up and say that when we created this apprenticeship program we were there was a fair amount of criteria including a, a resume, a physical um, testing, uh, a couple of other uh, checking s existing certification, that sort of thing, uh, swim evaluation. We did have 19 applicants, um, 11 of those showed up for the swim evaluation, eight were chosen for an interview, and ultimately six candidates were selected. So the estimated cost to go through the training program is about $2,000 per candidate or about $12,000 program will be probably six months at the end of the term. We're going through the lifeguarding piece. Uh, early in the new year we'll look at some instruction and uh, 
The good thing about going through the lifeguarding piece is, uh, first, is that once we these candidates have gone through that, they are now eligible to apply and actually start doing as working as a junior lifeguard, and then start doing some uh, instruction training. So, training will continue with the Bronze Medallion, Bronze Cross in October this month. Uh, then the National Lifeguard course in November. Uh, December candidates will, who have successfully completed the training will have the opportunity to apply for a casual lifeguard. In January, training continues with the Water Safety Instructor course. And in March, the apprentices, apprentices will complete their practical teaching during spring break. Um, all of these courses will be open to the general public to allow for any other people wanting to be trained as a lifeguard, lifeguard and instructor. So. Um, in terms of the shutdown, things went well. Um, all the work is now complete at the pool and we are once again open again. Uh, just quickly, uh, Dog Park uh, grand opening took place September 21st and staff are actually from subsequent to the last council meeting will be working. We reached out to School District 59 and, and Dog Park Society and trying to facilitate some meetings so we can uh, plan and manage that park efficiently as we go forward. So. We've also entered uh, into our after school sport and arts initiative program with School District 59 that kicks off or kicked off rather early in September. It's a great partnership, so there's some great programs and School District 59 will completely fund that program. Uh, we talked briefly already about the Christmas light up and the only quick thing I had was uh, in terms of the arenas. Um, uh, as you are aware, we had some challenges around startup in the memorial this year. I think we've uh, turned the corner. Uh, both rinks are now open and uh, I was away last week, but they were building ice at the Kearney Club and I'm led to believe that's probably uh, complete as we speak. So I'll wrap it up with that, Your Worship. Thank, Thank you. you, Ross. Question, Councillor Parslow. Yes, Kent Barrett Aquatic Centre. I'm not gonna ask the question I told you I might ask. Okay, so you're off the hook on that one. I'll come back to that at another more appropriate time. But just a small question here, just a, uh, your report talks about the uh, success of the uh, free swim program. And in 2019, 3,300 adults pay, paid admission. Did, uh, in 2018, uh, did adults pay admission or was it free for adults as well? It's just- uh, We waived it for the last month of that in August. Just for one Because we got the uh, okay. additional, the other, the but we, did, we didn't this year. Further questions? Councillor Earl? A uh, quick question with respect to the uh, free swim program. So an additional five to 10,000 visitors over uh, years where there's no free swim. I know we are required to have a certain number of uh, staff on hand per head. Just, uh, I, I don't expect you to have it, but if you could ballpark it or if you have any idea what additional costs were incurred above and beyond a normal year for staffing just because we did get that sponsored, but I, I'd be very surprised if the staffing requirements are a third or twice of what they would otherwise be if those sponsorships actually covered the cost. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, through your worship, I do not have that figure. I, I, I believe we raised uh, $20,000 in sponsorship that certainly would not have offset the total cost. Uh, those are big numbers, and yes, I think the short answer to your question, we would have required additional staff for that. I can come back to Council. It would be good information for us to yes. have as we consider this free swim. What's the, uh, what's the impact to uh, the subsidy uh, for us in the pool with uh, not having that revenue come in? And I think it's good information for a council to have if we can get it. We always anticipated, I think, our <coughs> revenue for those months was about 40 grand, and that's how we come up with the 20 and, and to offset it. But we always knew there was some increased costs because of the increased numbers. So, thank you. Any further questions for Ross? Thank you, Ross. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Development services. Good morning. Good morning. Well, mm. welcome to winter. <laughs> so, uh, Councillor Lexton brought up leaves on the road earlier, which reminds me uh, a little reminder about snow and seeing we have some out there. Um, we do often get some complaints about people moving snow out of the driveways, out on the roads, and, and when we do, we we have our bylaw visit and remind people that they need to move to either side. So, again,
again an opportunity to remind people that um, the street's not there for you to put your stuff on. You need to contain everything on your own property and, and manage that accordingly. So uh, hopefully that'll be the case moving forward. Also with um, early snowfalls, a reminder to everybody that these first ones are usually the uh, most slippy and there's no residue of salt or rock on the road. So uh, they can be quite slick when we get these early cool temperatures. So reminder everybody to slow down and uh, be safe. We've got all of our equipment ready and, and good to go. Um, graders, sand trucks, they're all equipped. Sidewalk plows are equipped, ready to go. We've got our new loaders, they're ready to go. So we're ready whenever whenever it hits. We, we've already got people in early and, and all weekends just, just in case we get some adverse weather. Um, a couple other things I wanted to touch on. Uh, railway crossing assessment. So we've got a draft uh, in our hands. So that's uh, it's going well. Just um, kind of an initial take from that is um, I thought of interest would be the whistle cessation piece. Um, basically some preliminary numbers that we've been given in the drafts is it looks like um, it'd be right around $400,000 per crossing to deal with whistle cessation. <coughs> Again, just at the draft stages, but I thought you know everybody's talking budget and numbers. And how much is it? Interesting. Yeah. So, so um, once we get the final and we've had an opportunity, we'll we'll bring that forward to council so to have all of that. So, um, South Dawson Reservoir, that's uh, moving along well. We're just about uh, 60, 65 percent full, so that's chugging along. That's great. Um, we also did some uh, raw water main inspection with some uh, new technology where um, Devin Arrow was working with a company that came in and actually inserted what they call a smart ball into our water main at one point and captured it at another point and uh, with that device they're able to detect leaks and a number of things and uh, so we've done, we've completed one section which is from the water treatment plant to the Alaska Highway Booster which is one of our Older uh, lines in town was installed by the army. Uh, anyways, that that section came back uh, in good shape, no leaks, no issues. Uh, the next uh, section that they will do will be the raw water line um, from uh, Hanson Reservoir uh, to the trails. So uh, we'll be doing that later in the year. So interesting. Um, cemeteries. Um, you saw a bylaw earlier in the meeting. We will be bringing an additional uh, amendment later on. Uh, that bylaw definitely needs to be updated and, and brought to a little more current standard. Uh, the reason that you saw the one today was simply out of need. We're, we're running out of space in some areas and we needed to open up the new section and we just didn't have uh, the bylaw updated so we could open up the new section and the new pricing for those. So that's, that's why we needed to get that in, in front of you like we did. Um, cemeteries were quite busy over the months of June, July, and August and into September. Um, I think we did a total of 39 burials. Um, so it's, it's pretty busy. It's not necessarily a good thing. Um, one other item I wanted to touch on was um, there was a park and play event in Crescent View Park back in September, I believe it was, and about 85 members of the community participated and um, they actually went around and marked some uh, storm drains and, and whatnot. It was, it was kind of some education around where your water goes and where it ends up, so a uh, great educational piece. Um, Probably the last couple things I wanted to touch on was uh, what we got. Compost. That's a fun topic. Uh, so we've been uh, managing or trying to manage the uh, yard waste that comes to our drop-off center on 99th Avenue. So. Uh, it is very popular, which is good because that means it's being uh, diverted out of the landfill. But it is um, a significant amount of work for our operations. And so we, during the busy months, which is, you know, May till September, and, and this year was busy because it was wet, so there was a lot of growth. Um, we are operating hauling truckloads from that drop-off center multiple times a day, every day. 
Um, so there's significant expense that goes along with that. Then that's only part of the picture is once we've got it, we now need to manage it according to uh, compost. So there's a lot of rules, regulations. So I've had Chelsea and uh, public work staff work very closely this year to try and manage it. We were running into some problems with space and being able to record temperatures and moistures and flip the material and, and get it to a state of where we could then in turn use it and take it off site or even give it to the public. So uh, happy to report that we, we uh, or they did a great job this year in getting that turned around and, and we've got a lot of the product able to be uh, utilized um, and created some more space for themselves. But um, um, it, is, it is an intensive program uh, it's a service that we provide. Uh, you know, it's good on one end out of the landfill, but there is a cost that's associated with that to, to get it to where we need to. Um, beavers, I know there were some questions, I think, last week about the activity in the community, and they're certainly um, active this time of year. So we will be doing some management, uh, nuisance management on that. We've gone through the permitting process, and we'll be working with the trapper on that. It, and dealing with that prior to winter, um, and also cleaning out some of those dams and whatnot, so when comes spring runoff, all that material doesn't end up choking off some culverts. So. Uh, the last thing I want to touch on was the Northeast climate risk. Um, council in 2017 had approved uh, some six thousand dollars and some staff time to participate in the Northeast climate risk network and so to date there's been three reports created uh, the Northeast BC Regional Climate Projections Report uh, a community scoping report specific to Dawson Creek and then a draft community vulnerability assessment so there will be at the November, November 25th committee the whole there will be two presentations an overview of the projection uh, report by the Fraser Basin Council and an over view of the vulnerability assessment uh, by Shift Collaborative. So that will be coming forward to Council. Um, and then it will be finished up in, in February of next year. So is there any questions on my report or anything I had there today? Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Councilor Lexer? Thanks, Your Worship. A couple thanks, Kev, for your report. I note, and this I'm guessing is probably 100% unintentional, bylaws still removing garage sale posters after the weekends. So I'm guessing it's the incumbent on the individuals who host the garage sale to go back and take these down. It just seems to be an added cost um, to the city taxpayer again. Um, so I, you know, encourage people, garage sales are wonderful, just follow up, I would think. 99% of the people never think that, oh, I should go grab that sign. But if there's a way we can make sure people are aware that they should, it would be helpful, I think, to our bylaw officers as well. And that opens the door. Uh, you talked about the whistle cessation as well. We had the opportunity to meet with uh, CN at the Union of British Columbia Municipalities. Uh, I've always believed whistles blowing tell you you have commerce happening on your tracks in your community, so I'm not opposed to that. I've always spoken to this. I'm opposed to 1.30 in the morning or 4.30 in the morning whistles going off when I look out my window after being woken up and see three cars being towed behind. So we have talked to them. I think CN is willing to work with us. They indicated based on scheduling issues. You know, whistles going during the day or in, in the early evening is not an issue for us. I think everybody accepts that. We live in a community that has to move products. So. Um, my hope would be that we can solve this issue without the expensive cost of gating our crossings for the benefit of the community. So just a quick update on that, that I think CN is committed to working with us and seeing what we can do on that. Um, having said that, as a budget issue, I just want to make something clear because it seemed to raise something. Seven million dollars out of our operations is coming from the fair share revenue that we're moving back to capital. That money is coming, at least that's our intent as a council, is to move that out. So when I said cut $7 million from operations, I'll clarify it. We're going to cut $7 million of fair share revenue that today sits in the operating side of the budget and move it over to capital. So in case there was any confusion there, if we find a new way to raise $7 million, good on us. I think that would be a hell of a tax increase, to be honest with you. But we have to do some serious changes. Um, the compost you talked about, I notice and I use it, it is an amazing uh, opportunity for the city to be able to haul their grass there and so on. 
Many times I see people trying to dump trees there, trying to throw their garbage bags in there, and not the compostable garbage bags. Um, I mean, if we have to put up a camera, uh, I think it would be worthwhile. It's staggering to me that we've posted signs, we ask politely, the 99% of the population adhere to it, but the ones that don't cost everybody else a significant amount of money. So. Again, more of a comment, if it takes us to put up a camera to make people have to adhere to it, maybe we put up a wall of shame, you know? I'm not sure what it would take, but it just staggers me that we try and try and try to do this. One final question, the recycling bins, we know we had some problem with contamination. How have we made out on that? We're still struggling, it's better. Um, what we find is if, if they're active doing their audits, um, and that is either 3R or that's uh, Dawson Creek uh, recycling, if they're out doing audits in front and kind of being proactive, we're seeing that it comes down. But if there's any relaxation on those audits, we tend to see it creep back up. Um, I saw some pictures on the weekend. Again, it, it, it did not look good. Uh, and again, it's just one sample of what but people are putting still. You know, you find leaves, garbage, and other things are still going in. And it doesn't take many of those individuals to ruin a, a significant amount of, of material. So, Are we? Load. Yeah. Would it be fair to say we're at risk of losing the entire program as a result of this? Like, I think at some point the cost analysis has to come in, and certainly if the recycling, uh, where this product goes, is unwilling to take it, I think we're going to have to make a tough call. I think. So the challenge is for DC Recycling, they're the ones that are really stuck in the middle, right? Yeah. They, they get the material picked up by waste management, waste management brings and drops it off to them, and then they're left to deal with whatever's in that, in that load and, and try and sort. Um, so that's, that's where the challenge lies. And, and so what we're working with DC Recycling is, is when they do the audits and when they find something, if they can let us know as soon as possible, bylaw will go and visit those individuals. And we find that if we do, corrective action typically occurs. Uh, the challenge is if we don't, if we're not made aware uh, until a week later, you've yeah. kind of lost that opportunity because to go up to somebody and say, "Hey, last week you kind of," or <coughs> ten days ago, you know, you need. It, it's great if we go the following day. And so we're working with DC Recycling to try and get that information as soon as possible. Because um, we found when we implemented the waste containers, and we had some problems initially, which is we would visit people, uh, you know, right away, and we found that that seemed to curve it, right, you know. So that's what we're trying to do. So just for clarification, the, uh, like our, our garbage collection, our recycling collection, we pay for the service to our residents to pick it up at the curb. Everything after that, the post collection is all the PRRD through our solid waste mm -hmm. management plan that we contribute to. So it's in increasing the cost of that overall solid waste management costs at the PRRD that we're all a part of. And so they're the ones paying the additional cost to DC recycling and the additional cost of sorting and all of that because that's who has the contract. So I guess I just raise it. My just frustrating. Yeah, my okay. concern would be that we have a a service today that I think the vast majority of people use and use pr very well, but we have the potential to lose this with contamination and that cost rising as a result of a select few not adhering to the rules. We're still paying it. We're still paying it into the RD, right? That cost. So. Councillor Wilbur. Um, I just think too that in in ha with staff having discussions with DC Recycling, so I think we're long past the point of giving out warning tickets to people. Um, you know, to let them know, look, this is your warning, clamp your recycling. I think we're at the point, the last pictures posted were horrific, like horrific. And the employees at DC Recycling are going through all of that stuff by hand. They're literally having to, to crawl through that stuff to clean it up. And it's contaminating whole loads. It's not just one or two bins. The whole load is garbage. And so I think really from the city's perspective, I think that's part of the conversation is no more warning tickets. If you have ba a bad recycling bin, you're getting a ticket. Deal with it, clean it up. It, it, it is really bad. We are, we're talking dirty diapers, you know, the dog's business. It, it's, it's just, it's horrible what they're having to dig through when it's a great program and it's easy to do. And so, you know, obviously some of the educational pieces that have been put out through social media haven't been as effective as they could. I don't know what the answer is. Goofy videos or something, I don't know. 
but I honestly I've seen them out there checking the bins and I think it's beyond time for the community to get a warning ticket if you can't clean up your recycling you're getting the ticket okay we got to move because we got uh, go, go ahead try be as quick as I can your worship uh, so just a couple things um, and this is referring back to the um, report we got around um, consolidated uh, to actual budget variance under the capital projects and the progress uh, first one is I see one sewer capital um, item was not started because there weren't any bids received and I know of being familiar with the the equipment if we don't get a bid sometimes it works to our advantage insofar as we can then go out and competitively shop for it but do we what is the process do we just not do the project and we put it out next year or do we have the opportunity to and I think that was the Sager is that the Sager yeah. project on the list yes yeah so. that was the challenge is, is um, and we did we talked to some contractors throughout the process and they they just really struggled with um, being able to bid on it because of how it was laid out so we're going to look at it and kind of regroup on it and see if there's something that we can change on our end to try and make it a little easier to get get some pricing on. Okay, and uh, just one follow-up, same thing under the capital projects in looking at uh, what the budget is, where the variance was. Uh, I see that uh, the four or five uh, projects that went slightly over budget, um, three or four are occurring in uh, my old stomping ground at the event center. Um, I know with Spectre Venue Management, capital projects taking place within the building aren't subject to the normal uh, bid requirements for the city as managed by Spectre Venue Management. In instances where these projects are going over budget, are we as a city on the hook for that or is that coming out of their budget? Duncan? So this this actually would fall under community services as Ross okay. is the li liaison for that group, so I'll, I'll jump in. But um, going through that, yeah, there are two projects that are slightly over. There is also another project that is uh, substantially under, and it's mm -hmm. that balance between okay. that. So there's seventeen thousand dollars surplus from the uh, from the uh, HVAC equipment, and uh, as far as the jumbotron, it, what doesn't show here is the fifty thousand dollar grant that we received for that okay. project. So it shows three hundred and sixty one and a budget of three fifty. However, there was a fifty thousand uh, dollar grant received for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Kevin. Thank you. So, 146, we have a report from our airport manager. Good morning, Rick. Good morning, Your Worship. Good morning, Council. Good day. Very happy to be here for our first report to the committee as a whole. Um, with your report, first of all, uh, just to continue on with where the water flows from Kevin. So today was the first the first day that Brocar has begun uh, their uh, ACAP project at the airport of putting new culverts in. So we're we're happy that that began today. Um, since we're new to your airport, there's some low hanging fruit. To, we've been given direction to uh, increase revenue and decrease uh, operating costs at the airport. Uh, there was some low hanging fruit that we've done uh, that we've already initiated. Uh, I'll go through some of it. So our uh, <coughs> airport, our city employees have been trained in the fuel uh, testing and inspection program and they've also been trained in the de-icing operations program and they are um, October 2nd, they, uh, they, our city employees are now doing the um, de-icing of uh, aircraft when needed. And uh, as of October 11th, they've started doing the fuel checks. And this has resulted in a decrease in hours of about 25% from our security and fueling contract. So. Um, <coughs> Our security contract has now gone from basically charging us for 40 hours a week down to uh, 30 hours a week. So, um, with that, uh, since we're speaking about de-icing, we're currently evaluating, we have one de-ice vehicle and when it's not 
operational as was the case on October the 8th, I believe. Um, and the airline can use that as an excuse not to fly in, if the weather is uh, close. I've seen it before in the past. So sometimes it just makes uh, better business sense for the airline to not come in and say it was the airport's fault rather than uh, uh, telling the passengers the truth that it was a financial uh, decision of the aircraft. On that day, there was two other aircraft that, went, uh, that used the airport that did not require the de-icing services. Um, so I mentioned the ACAP funding that started today. Um, staff training. Uh, <coughs> since we've taken over, we wanted to do a, our company wanted to do a, uh, a facilities infrastructure inspection. So our runway is in very, very good shape. We had a runway friction testing completed this year. Um, runway life is currently at like 87% and there hasn't been any major work uh, done to the runways in a long time and we can't foresee any in the in the next hopefully five years because of uh, our airport staff are diligent in doing crack sealing every year so we want to continue along that way uh, along that route the, our buildings so uh, in consultation with Ross and his group, we are getting our uh, the tower and the air terminal building uh, have a facility inspection done with regards to what uh, upkeep, what what needs to be done to keep our buildings operating. Uh, financially, uh, the 2020 budget submission, the proposed, has gone in uh, from the airport. Uh, however. In the future, as in right now, I'm, uh, I want to look at the budget more line by line item just to see where the airport has spent money in the past and where there's opportunities to spend less and where we need to spend more to remain regulatory compliant. Um, so s I, I mentioned some of the low hanging fruit was to, uh, we but some of the long-term goals or the long-term things we're looking at that are being studied now during this winter is um, uh, maybe initiating an aircraft parking fee. So currently we have the small airports, uh, the small uh, aircraft operators who park at our airport for free. Uh, it sounds good, it sounds good for business, but it creates uh, uh, an opportunity for people that never fly to just park their junk at the airport. So um, we're looking at what other airports in the region charge for aircraft parking fees. It's usually a daily, monthly, or annual uh, or annual fee, and we're we're looking at that in the future, uh, maybe providing that to uh, our current customers and clients. Um, of course, long term, we we have to look at uh, adding an airport improvement fee, and that would basically, if if the city wants to do that, if we're given direction to do that, it would uh, help cover the cost of some of the capital expenditures at the airport in the future. Um, we are working with the airlines uh, for the development of air services, so. While I'm there, if if you go to the uh, 2019 aircraft movement and passenger statistics, I'm 100% <coughs> uh, fine with the 2019 aircraft movements because they those come from Nav Canada, Peace uh, the Peace River Flight Service Station give, uh, knows what lands here for 16 of the 24 hours uh, of every day. When they're closed at night. It's uh, it's like the Wild West. We don't have statistics, but <laughs> <clears throat> we're working on providing those. And what what I uh, the numbers that come in for 16 hours a day. If you look at it in 2019, we're already over the total for the all of 2018 of of 5174. That's accurate. What I'm not ac what I'm not confident in is the passenger statistics. We get our passenger counts from Central Mountain Air, 
but we don't get our passenger counts from two of the three charter companies that actually uh, fly into our airport. So if you look at that, it shows that we've uh, had 5,580 passengers this year. Well, we've had 5,174 aircraft, which means there's only one point, not ought, <laughs> uh, uh, people per flight. So I'm not very confident. Uh, I think our charter passengers numbers are a lot higher, so we're currently working uh, at providing better statistics for that. Uh, medevac services, we have no statistics. I've been in contact with NAV Canada, both at headquarters and I'll find out from the end of the week from Peace River and they might be able to give me a, a, a monthly medevac uh, uh, flight operations into and out of Dawson Creek which uh, <clears throat> which would be very helpful for us but it's it's also helpful uh, for the community and for the airport going forward. Um, that's about all I have. I see that I'm rather brief compared to some of the other departments at the city. <laughs> um, I have some uh, uh, some ongoing stuff uh, through that you'll be seeing. You're going to need council's approval of the user fee schedule increase now that we're providing the application of the de-icing to the aircraft. Uh, that'll be coming across your desks in the n near future and uh, some other we partnered with uh, at the airport with Hope Era charity program that brings uh, uh, people with medical needs and surgeries uh, free flights to wherever they need them based on need and um, yeah the, the airport's shown a healthy increase in the number of aircraft landing here over 2018 and uh, and we want to study that further like I say to make our passenger statistics and our medevac statistics uh, more in line with what with what they actually are and just what's being reported in the past. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Councillor Parzal. Yeah thank you it's very interesting the scheduled list uh, would you unpack that a little bit I mean obviously scheduled in, in, includes CMA Mm -hmm. But what other carriers are covered in that schedule? Is it post office services or what is it? No, that scheduled is uh, would be a CMA. The I the itinerant would be the um, um, the charters that come in, like from Arc Resources oh. and then Canna. So in May, for instance, then yes. um, to read that 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 417 is entirely CMA. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Further questions? Well, thank you, Rick. Uh, we appreciate the information. Obviously, we're uh, happy to have uh, Wasco here, and we look forward to continuing to build upon your expertise for our airport. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And next, we have our Spectre Venue Management Tourism, Dawson Creek. How you doing? I should send you some photographs. Have you? Very good. Oh, is she? Thank you, sir. I'm surprised she would send them to you so clearly. You have a special relationship going on? Thanks, Barry. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, uh, gentlemen. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, first good one. Yeah, first one. Welcome back. Yeah, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Worship, Council, Administration. Uh, thanks again for the, uh, the welcome. Um, we have a few uh, few things to share with you today. Um, and and uh, it's, it's, it's definitely great to be back in Dawson Creek around some familiar faces. Uh, as you know, I started my career back here in 2007. I'm um, extremely excited to take on this new opportunity and challenge becoming the general manager of the Independent County Event Center and tours in Dawson Creek. Um, you know, driving up a couple weeks ago, definitely a lot of fond memories of, of the community, the region, uh, the building from, from, from day one when, when the building was opened. Um, and I have been looking in from afar over the last, you know, it's been eight years, um, to see 
you know, all the, the, the activity and the excitement that's, you know, continued to play, take place um, in the building as, you know, the city and the event center has, you know, really, you know, finalized that goal of becoming, you know, the event center of the piece. I, I fully understand, having been here before, the, um, the importance that the venue plays in the community, um, not only as a catalyst of economic development, but, you know, in bringing people together for sport, cultural events, and community well-being. Uh, for those that have worked with me before, communication, collaboration, and community uh, have always been things that I valued and I uh, value the, the strong partnership and relationship that's been forged with the city, staff, and Spectre venue management. Uh, obviously, the last month has been a, uh, been a whirlwind of transition, uh, but we have a very strong team both at the event center and, the, and Tourism Dawson Creek that will continue to move uh, things forward uh, to make this as seamless as possible. Uh, as you see, we don't have a formal report to you today uh, with this transition, but we did want to highlight a few things over the summer season as we felt that, you know, we want to keep council up to date with, with the activities, uh, but we will be bringing uh, a formal report as we kind of finalize um, everything for, for the year. So with that, uh, just a couple of quick stats to share with you. Uh, the Alaska Highway House uh, saw increased visitation over this past summer of 22 percent uh, which which is great to see people moving around around the community and into our downtown core our main visitor center up at NER Park saw a seven percent increase um, during the months of May through September this year and a big part of that is, is that utilization of the mile zero master pass and getting people to, to move around the community so again that that program which started a year ago this year it was in the second year uh, saw saw an increase as well a few other kind of key projects that um, and initiatives that tourism has uh, been undertaking over the last uh, quarter. Uh, Barry and Lindsay were at the Northern BC Tourism Summit uh, in Prince George earlier this month and presented on, you know, our model of tur tourism and event strategy um, and our su success with hosting events. Uh, we've been working with the Fort St. John NBC uh, Winter Games Committee in uh, finding locations for. Uh, there are ski events, uh, working with minor hockey in town as well as other sport hosting groups. Um, and then another initiative this past summer was working with Destination BC on, on coming up and really profiling the community in a couple of specific niche uh, video content which they'll be releasing next year. Um, finally, uh, another kind of key part, as you know, as part of our work here is um, not just the development, but the implementation of our sport and event <coughs> tourism strategy and how we're going to become leaders, um, not just now, but into the next number of years um, in this area. So uh, obviously, uh, we've been very successful in uh, hosting large profile hockey events, but utilizing you know, our expertise um, and knowledge in, in hosting those type of provincial and national sport uh, events and how we can leverage that into hosting others, curling, volleyball, etc. Um, so with that, I know there's been a, 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 there's a lot going on right now. Um, I'm going to pass it over to our new Assistant General Manager of Tourism, and he uh, is going to give us a quick update um, about the WHL series. So thank you, Dustin and Mayor Worship. Nice to be back. Uh, hard to believe I, I just don't want to go away. Um, I understand this morning the hospital foundation was in, so I don't want to uh, go through everything that they spoke about, but I wanted to uh, support a couple of key highlights. Um, you know, as we know, that the, the sports side was sort of created and pushed through some of the strategy to deliver the Hockey Canada uh, mandate, but I can tell you that that hockey mandate is, is allowing us to grow in very different ways. Uh, first and foremost, we talked about the champion. Someone has to be the champion, and I believe Council has pushed that through and supported that. Um, we understand the realistic goals and expectations we have to deliver on and the challenges of budget. We're well aware of that. Uh, so we're working very hard to, uh, to bring back to Council some great options as we move forward on the sport and tourism side. Um, but the second part is that what we're really finding in the sport uh, event side is creation of community. And I think there are a number of examples that we could certainly highlight out of the Western Hockey League example. Um, every partnership, every sponsor that we created built community spirit, uh, community pride. Uh, a number of them, uh, Safeway was, was a great example, our collaboration in regards to work with the co-op, 
how smiley cookies, a thousand smiley cookies were created that generated revenue back to our hospital foundation, all in ways of working together in, in a spirit of community. Um, some of the hockey events that did happen were, were also highlighted by top 14 Western Hockey League players from, uh, you know, go on the ice with our Adam House League kids it will be a thrill those kids will never forget, uh, nor the parents and also with our Pee Wee groups. But I, I was very proud of the fact that Tim Horton stepped up as a sponsor and, and we did basically pond hockey. And that pond hockey was having kids from Fort Nelson play with Grand Prairie kids, playing with Dawson kids and Chetwin kids. And all of those pushed back, the revenue was put back into tickets, back into seats. So uh, great to see. Um, but, but out of that, uh, probably some of the biggest highlights was the partnership we worked with our library and the reading program all summer uh, was highlighted with a visit as well by the Western Hockey League players. A trip up to Rotary Manor into into the hospital, and the viral that uh, video that went a bit viral was Goche, the goalie. It's played on our national team uh, as well, uh, holding a, pre a baby that was just born. Uh, certainly, pumped a lot of excitement into the hospital as well as creating a community event. Uh, so what I did to highlight, I I, I sent uh, Ichi as I gave a copy of the of the two letters. I don't need to, I'll, le I'll leave that with you. I don't need to expand, but I think. When you read into it, I think what you see is community, and, and both those those groups were very happy to put what we called Fabulous Friday. Uh, highlighted as well, the last part of that was we uh, visited eight local schools, and uh, five in Fort St. John, and an academy in Fort St. John. So the community engagement out of a sport event that builds community pride should be where we drive our events. That in future also opens up uh, our opportunities and and abilities that Lindsay's done a great job in working with our hoteliers that we have a very unique opportunity as we move forward in, in bringing events that we can finally start to plan longer term uh, that you you can actually have those people stay overnight and traditionally we've worked way too long or have had history that have our people uh, coming to the events knowing they can't get hotels and so it's difficult to host a 16 team volleyball tournament when you don't have teams and when they start to schedule with schedules around the convenience of traveling back and forth to their hometown doesn't allow us that luxury. So think a little bit about that. We're very excited. I'm excited to work with Dustin, um, Lindsay, and we just, uh, one last note, Angela is leaving on maternity leave, and we've hired Jamie Case. So we're very excited about Jamie's background in the sport uh, side. And um, I'll leave it with that if there's any questions. I, I am excited to be in the role uh, now as well. Uh, going across and helping Dustin uh, deliver part of the, the tourism side. I'm very excited and uh, I, I chatted very briefly as I was handing out the papers and Councillor Parzo mentioned I, was, I, I see his granddaughter uh, playing college hockey and uh, I fear not to actually see a post of you in the dressing room so I'm very uh, proud to pick on you. On that. <laughs> Did I have my shares on? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> thank you Barry. So, thank you for that. Uh, questions for Dustin or Barry? Yeah obviously the um, the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the event uh, hospital foundation we're in and it was evident uh, for that, that it was uh, well received and really spread throughout the community. So it's a great job. And Dustin, we're excited about having you uh, come into the event center and uh, as a new general manager. And it's, as you said, it's an important facility for our community. And we look forward to building upon that and making it uh, continue to be a great facility for our community. So thank, thank you. you. Unfortunately, we got we're tight, and we got another meeting. We got close, so we appreciate you guys coming. We're going to take a three-minute recess to get to close. There's the uh, everyone will uh, take this opportunity to uh, open the public consultation for uh, the upcoming uh, budget uh, cycle season for uh, our 2020 budget, and so today there is. This, there isn't a formal agenda. There isn't a, a f any presentation that's going to be made. It's a, it is exactly that. It's an opportunity for us to extend to the public any uh, questions, comments uh, uh, that they may have about the process and what we're doing, and give us some begin that process of giving us some input into our budget. Flavie, do you have anything to add to that? No, that, that's exactly it. And also, uh, we have, like we mentioned in the morning, we have this survey available online and also in paper, so where the residents can have their opportunity to comment, uh, provide suggestions um, for this 2020 budget uh, process. Thank you. And so council has uh, set uh, 
a firm strategic priority about building a strong financial future uh, for the uh, city. And as was mentioned earlier in our open meeting, that um, we have uh, $50 million in our Peace River Agreement allocation. Uh, the strategic direction that council, this council has set towards that is 85% of that uh, Peace River Agreement money will flow into uh, operations. It's about $12.5 million, approximately 12.2. Uh, in seven years, what flow did into, I say? Flow into capital. To capital. Flow into our. Uh, We're budget. trying to get that eighty-five out operations. In, out of our operating into our capital, <laughs> and um, and um, that's the that's a big bit of work that uh, council has ahead of themselves over the next uh, five, six, seven years of um, direction, and um, budget process then is set the operating budget and uh, the parameters around that for us is really about, uh, I call it protective services, police, fire, building inspection, and uh, by law enforcement, and then all of the arts, culture, recreation, transportation, um, all of those other uh, components of the budget along with then public works, uh, are operating our water, sewer utility, and the capital and operating costs that go into that. Um, and then build a capital uh, budget that um, comes out of that uh, revenue anticipation and expenditures and how we build that capital and allocate the capital spending for the year in terms of uh, <coughs> roads and sidewalks, <coughs> uh, building, um, and all of the associated work that goes with capital. So it is, an, it's an emo it, unless you sit in this chair, these chairs, it's an amazing amount of uh, work effort energy that goes into this on behalf of our staff and council to get to a point where you are able to build that capital plan for the future and I keep using that term that we've set as a strong financial future um, and it is about um, moving that initially out of uh, the reliance on uh, the peace or agreement to uh, operate. So with that I'll throw it open and Robin, since you're the uh, public today, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> if you had any questions or comments to come. You mean I can talk? Absolutely. Yeah. Is he that right Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's the most diligent, he's the most diligent public we have. Yeah. We're happy to have him here. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. like this morning I, got, I, I took the bus to the um, counter center is vote. And I'm really grateful I didn't have to pay. But I mean, you know what? I was the only, I was the single passenger on the bus mm -hmm. up to past Walmart, I think. And so then it's like, when I talked to the driver, the driver said he drives 200 miles a day. So we got one passenger, that's an awful lot of that's an awful lot of interest. And um, the other thing, though, is if I were to take the cab from here to Canada, that cab would be 20 bucks. If I go from downtown to the Starbucks to the hospital, it's 10 bucks. And so maybe they can make the taxi drivers a little bit less or something. Or uh, I don't know if it makes any sense. But um, 10 bucks is too much out of my pocket. And 20 bucks is way too much. And so maybe that's something we can look at. Because I can certainly understand the cost of driving the bus on the city budget for a year, which is horrendous without cost. At the same time, both parts like me need transportation of some kind because the problems will give me everything. <coughs> So transit is absolutely a, a topic of conversation and like any service you're providing, is it, is it meeting the needs of your community? Is it providing value? And if it isn't providing value or if it's not meeting the needs of your community, you've got to look at different options or alternatives and I think that's what council has said is we got to look at some options that are going to be one, realistic and provide value and obviously we're spending a whole ton of money on transit that uh, is not getting utilized and that's the question and there's a segment of our population and segment of our community that absolutely need transit 
for their transportation. They don't have another option. And as you've said, they don't have the money to be mm -hmm. hiring cabs all day long. And the hospital does, does provide me with groceries. If I'm in the hospital and they don't want me walking out, they're walking home in the middle of the night. They insist, they, they, uh, they insist on giving me groceries, but that's almost a given thing, which is another thing that I appreciate. <coughs> No. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Council, do you have any comments? Anybody? Can I say um, Joanne? Okay. Yeah, Hi. go ahead. Hello. Um, just on the comment around the bus um, situation, I just also wanted to say that for us at the KPAC, um, our Kiwanis Child Care Centre does use the bus quite regularly to take kids to and from school. Um, so we offer the service for parents that they can drop their kiddos off with us and then our caregivers will ride the city bus and then drop them off at one of the different schools that they go to and then do the reverse after schools. Um, so I know there's been some concern with our staff that if the busing gets cut or even the hours a little bit get changed, then it really throws off the service that we're able to provide for parents because as it is now, the caregivers that ride the school bus, or sorry, ride the city bus to take the kids um, some of them do arrive a little bit after the bell just because of the way the drop-offs go so any major time changes you know forward or backwards will affect you know what we can offer to our um, families that use our center so currently we have about oh, 30 families that we provide this service for and so for a lot of parents it's an essential service we all know we have to go to work and sometimes that's usually before kiddos have to go to school um, and then in my own personal life I know with all my kids that you guys seem to keep having. They <laughs> like to ride the city bus, um, you know, for after school care. Again, they are not for after school to get home. So I know that, you know, the kids in our community do use the bus. Um, maybe not as, you know, as much as it needs to be used, but I know for us it is an essential service that we try to provide to those families for our child care center. Was that 30 a day, Joanna, yeah. that would use the service? Yeah. And we've looked at different options ourselves, just in case, you know, is there a better option that we can provide? Um, the option we've looked at is looking into Step Up and Ride and working out some partnership with them. Uh, the, so we do have a tentative idea of what we can work with. The problem being is Step Up and Ride has three buses and their third bus that they have um, is kind of their backup bus. So if anything happens to any of their other buses, they've got a third bus to go to. So now, if we contract with them to be our provider to drop off all our kiddos, it, then they pretty much have to put that third bus in service all the time, which leaves them without a backup bus. Um, but it is something that you know we are tentatively talking to them about, and then also talking about what that would cost what that looks like um, but again just just so everyone's aware on the city level that we do use um, the city bus quite regularly to provide that <coughs> thank you mm -hmm. councillor lexer just a question joanna yeah. on that so you do that i understand your the provision of care for the children is a full cost recovery you recover the yes. full cost yeah. for that have yeah. you also thought, I mean, because every time then you utilize the bus to take a child to the school or whatever, mm -hmm. and I'll use around now, it's about $7 yes. for the taxpayer that subsidizes that ride each way. Mm -hmm. Is there something you would look at with the parents, for example, to say, look, if we need to provide that service, you'll pay this much a month, and yes. if you don't need that service, I just, okay. Yeah, absolutely, okay. and right now we require the parents to buy bus taxes for their kiddos, so it is a service that they're already paying for, and then we do have some of our kids that Step Up and Ride currently already does right. pick up, does the door-to-door -door service, so they'll pick them up at home and drop them off, and then drop them off at our center after school, and parents do pay for that separately. So, I mean, if we do have to change our service to include um, using the Step Up and Ride all around, then it would be something that we would then, yes, have to pass back to parents as um, something, an option for That's them. A okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Other councillor Parson? Well, good for you <coughs> looking ahead and thinking about alternatives. That's good. Uh, what happens, do you know, uh, from your ro role in communities that never had transit? How do kids' parents deal with that, it, such as Chetwind or Fort Nelson? Or yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I, no, I don't. I'm going to find out. But uh, I just thought you might have some dialogue with mm. some, of those, uh, some of those folks. Yeah, no, off the top of my head, I don't really 
Yeah. You know, I shared with council this 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 morning, and after discussions with a few people, you know, like if you have thirty kids using that service just once a day. Well, twice a day. I mean, twice it, it, a day. it kind of varies because there's some kiddos that you know only need the morning drop-offs, and then some kiddos that only need afternoons, and then some that need both. So, yeah. I mean, that number of 30 kind of does vary throughout the day. I mean, I do have in my office all of the stats, and I'd be more than happy to share them with you as yeah. to what our ridership is. So, um, the so the cost to the city for mm -hmm. providing that service just for one day is $520 subsidy, just yeah. for your reference point. Yeah, oh, I, was, I can totally appreciate the fact that it costs an enormous amount to, you know, run something that, yeah. you know, for us is just a small portion of the day that we need the bus service when there's a lot of other hours in the day. Councillor Earl and Councillor Jebeck. Uh Thank you, Your Worship, and, and thank you both. Uh, so to Johanna and Robin's point, I think they've, they've uh, hit the nail on the head. For those who rely on the service, it's vital. Um, but from the standpoint of the community, the ridership, the usage rate is not sufficient to justify the existing uh, model. So we do, we did have a, a presentation recently from uh, the people of BC Transit around a less costly model and to maintain, uh, part of that model included maintaining service on weekdays during peak hours. Um, and today, Councillor Parzlo brought forward a motion that we get together with the people at the school board, the, their board of trustees, to discuss uh, this issue among others. So I, I do think uh, as we move forward through this issue, Council does recognize what the, the needs are, and it, it'll just be a matter of uh, working together with people in the community and other stakeholders to figure out how we can land on something that's both affordable and is going to uh, meet the requirements of the people that do use it. I know, I mean, yeah, I dropped my kid off at daycare, but if I had to rely on a, a bus service when she's a little older, it'll be, you know, that, that's a very, uh, I mean, that takes precedent over everything. And when you're getting your day started, um, getting your little one ready and out the door or dropping them off to where they need to be so you can, uh, is kind of, if you can't get that done, everything else grinds to a halt. So I, I, I do appreciate uh, your concern and and it is something we're very very acutely aware of Councillor Javerka so you're saying you said you take kids to the schools or uh, like what happens the the parents bring them before school yeah. so then you have to deliver them to the school correct yeah so for some parents our center opens at 7 30 in the morning so for some parents that's you know a relatively quite a bit earlier than schools start so they do we offer the before school and after school care um, so, so for any parent that has to work between the hours of 7 30 and 5 30 um, we have care for those kiddos so exactly they get dropped off at our center uh, then we round them up some schools are within walking distance so our caregivers will walk to those schools but of course some of them like Crescent Park and Frank Ross and stuff are quite a ways out um, and so those are the ones that we ride the bus for and then again variety of options for after school they so ride the bus do you bus. have both uh, city residents and rural in your I would have to take a look at what those all are I don't know <coughs> Um, but I do know that there are a number of, the, again, in-town students that are riding the bus. Um, again, just because of the nature of parents' work schedules, that it, it's convenient for them. <coughs> I'd have to look at what the whole ratio there is. Any other questions? Rob, anything? No? One, one for Urban. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you, you guys can take that outside. <laughs> You're in it now. <laughs> Anything uh, further from anybody? Well, just uh, child care is a is a big issue uh, for working people in a variety of different circumstances. But it's, it's certainly not a northern issue. It's an issue for everyone wherever. <coughs> You know, as you were talking, I was thinking about uh, when I've uh, babysat grandchildren in the Lower Mainland, right? And, and I have some other things I have to do, but I think of my daughters. They, they drive their kids to uh, relatives on Monday and Fridays at 6.30 in the morning. 
Others don't have relatives, so uh, they have to drop them off at uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, and then they have some, the daycare has a little bus of its own that picks them up after school. And uh, it's a juggle. It's, it's a real, real it nightmare. But they, they, don't, they don't use transit. It's just not, you know, it's, it's, not it's just, just not an option. The bus doesn't come anywhere near their place. And, and they're also fairly paranoid about children's safety uh, because it's dark at certain times, just like it is up here. So it is a real problem. Oh, well, absolutely, sure. and I mean, I can totally appreciate the cost of the bus. We did look at buying our own bus, yeah. you know, as an option as well for us because we've got so many kiddos, and then we thought, well, this would be great because then we could take them on field trips. We can go to the windmills whenever we want. And, um, but the cost, that, and when we're looking into it, I mean, I know what it would cost for us to maintain and run a bus, and it is quite expensive. It's why we don't have a bus. So, I mean, I absolutely appreciate, you know, what City Council has to look at as far as big buses. We're looking at a little short bus. So, big bus is going to be quite expen more expensive to run. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so for us, we're just, you know, again, being proactive and trying to yeah. think of what our other options are um, out there. Because, again, I'm a big believer in not duplicating services. So, if there is a service like Step Up and Ride that could provide us with this option, it makes more sense to work with them than us take on the financial risk of buying a bus in order to run that for ourselves. So, yeah, so we're looking at all options, but just one thing I thought I would share with my council and family. Can they, get, can they not get school district 59 to bus students? So it was one of the directions today that we're going to, uh, council has uh, said as we'll organize a meeting with the school trustees with school district 59 to talk about that in terms of the heavy reliance in the morning and afternoon of uh, traffic for the buses is students. So uh, is that now all of a sudden the uh, responsibility of city taxpayers to pay for transportation of students? We, anyway, we're going to have that conversation with them. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming today. We appreciate it. And uh, this budget process will be uh, finished the end of April in 2020. So we look forward to a number of months and a number of discussions. And this will be the first of many. And when we come up with the draft in the spring, you're the only ones that get to complain or provide. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, guys. So we'll take five minutes.